I would like to um, welcome all of you. Uh, welcome to our symposium today. Uh, I'm Christian Hagemann. I'm executive director of the Southeast Europe Association. And um, you're probably wondering why I'm sitting here while you were promised uh, Professor Christian Voss. Uh, he will uh, join us online in a minute for his introduction, but he unfortunately uh, cannot be with us today uh, because of an illness and um, will, uh, will still be there online. So um, I'm glad that you are all here for this very important topic and on this very sad anniversary that we have today of uh, Russia's full-scale attack on Ukraine um, after already uh, many years of war against it. But what we see is that uh, Ukraine is still standing strong and uh, the West is still united and uh, probably what goes beyond the expectations that many people had exactly one year ago uh, the country did not fall after three days of war, but uh, could not only uh, defend itself, but also win uh, territory back. So what we do here today is, of course, what we know best. Uh, we discuss, we analyze things, and we take a closer look. And we have uh, five fascinating presentations today. And Professor Foss, I hope you can hear me, and I will give over to, uh, to you for the introduction of our speakers and the topic. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to this panel on Russia in the Balkans. I keep my introduction very short and present today's program, which will be analyzing the resilience or vulnerability to Russian strategic communication disinformation in Southeast Europe. Today, we have invited complementary country experts in relation to the authors from the special South Südost Europa Mitteilung issue the war in, and Russia's influence in Southeast Europe that came out some weeks ago. This is not about imposing a patronizing imperative, wir schaffen das, and criticizing the relationship to Russia of especially those countries that are not so rich and not so close to us regarding culture or religion. No, our overview is supposed to identify potentials and our own scopes of action. How will Russia be perceived in the Balkans in 10 years time? And how can we strengthen a European identity in the region and solidarity with Ukraine? I think that the humanities potential political analysis is underrated because they can make a valuable contribution. Foucault and Bourdieu taught us that language is not only an instrument of communication or even knowledge, but also an instrument of power. We know that narratives, discourses, and performances don't only influence reality, but can be more powerful and even shape and recreate it. Therefore, cultural studies providing an analysis of present discourses is always highly indicative for the future development. Let me introduce our guests who I have divided into two small panels. We will start with Jan Behrens, Professor for Dictatorship and Democracy at the European University Viadrina in Frankfurt, Oder. He's the author of the book Invented Friendship from 2006, in which he describes how in Eastern Germany and Poland after 45, an attempt was made to establish narratives of admiration, worship and affection, and how this failed. With him as an expert of cultural diplomacy, we have the opportunity to place our case examples within a larger trans-regional context. The second speaker is Tatiana Petza, professor for Slavonic literature and cultural studies at the University of Graz. As an expert on Russian and South Slavonic literatures, she knows the entangled imaginations of these literatures. Today, she will reverse the perspective by not asking about Russian literary soft power among the South Slavs, but the other way around. How have the Southeast Europeans inscribed themselves into a Russian cultural and emotional, emotional mental map? How does Banja Luka or Salonika feel today from St. Petersburg? The second part of our program leads us to individual Southeast European countries and focuses on current narratives of Russia. Melinda Harloff recently completed her PhD on heritageization in Hungary and is an outstanding expert in memory culture and public history. I have asked her to explain how Viktor Orban 
manages to position his country as pro-Russian, despite a communicative memory that is characterized by the revolution of 56 and the protest against Moscow. Our fourth speaker is Dimitar Bechev from Oxford, whose book Rival Power, Russia in Southeast Europe from 2017 deals with Russian soft power, especially in Bulgaria, Greece, and Serbia. This interdisciplinary reference work on Russians, Russia's geopolitical influence over the Balkans received a new importance in February 22. And today, Dimitri will be talking about the differences before and after the Russian attack on Ukraine. Chavdar Marinov is one of the leading historians in Bulgaria who completed his PhD in Paris on Macedonian civil war refugees and has published on mass nationalism since 19th century. He will highlight Russian influence with the example of the current conflict between Bulgaria and North Macedonia on historic identity or language. Or to put it more precisely, does Putin consider Cyril and Methodios or Gotsodelchev Bulgarians or Macedonians? We have relaxed language rules today and can speak English as well as German and thus hopefully include everyone present. Now I will give the floor to Christian Hagemann. Since I'm still recovering from a corona infection, he will moderate and share this event. Thanks for coming and for your interest. Okay, thank you very much, Christian, and get well soon. Um, so just a few remarks on how we will proceed. Uh, Christian already said it's divided like into two mini panels. Uh, we will have uh, first two presentations and after this a short round of discussion and then again three presentations and a short round of discussion. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes and I will keep the time for you and I would like to ask you to stick to the time for the sake of your colleagues time and the time for discussion and uh, without much further ado I would like to give the floor to Professor Behrens for his presentation. Ja, vielen Dank für die Einladung hier zum Symposium der Südosteuropa-Gesellschaft. Das hat mich sehr gefreut. Ähm, Herr Voss sagte mir, dass man auch Deutsch sprechen kann. Deswegen habe ich jetzt Deutsch äh, vorbereitet. Ähm, ähm, ja, so, so bedrückend das ist, heute am Jahrestag des russischen Überfalls auf die Ukraine hier vor Ihnen zu stehen. Normalerweise wäre ich jetzt mit meinen ukrainischen Studierenden in Berlin auf einer Demonstration unter dem Motto das Ungeheuerliche nicht hinnehmen. Aber da ich Herrn Voss, äh, wie gesagt, gute Besserung, ähm, schon zugesagt habe, äh, finde ich mich nun hier und nutze die Gelegenheit zu einen Ausflü einigen Ausflügen in die Geschichte russischer Kulturdiplomatie und äh, Propaganda. Gerd Köhn hat ja in seinem ausgezeichneten Werk die historischen Ursprünge des deutschen Russlandkomplexes freigelegt. Und heute sehen wir, denke ich, auch äh, in den Debatten, die in Deutschland, aber auch in Gesamteuropa geführt werden, ähm, wie wirkungsmächtig diese Komplexe bis in die Gegenwart noch sind. Doch es greift zu kurz, allein über die vermeintliche deutsch-russische Wahlverwandtschaft äh, zu reden. Wir müssen, wie in diesem Panel angedacht, über sowjetische und russische Public Diplomacy in ihrem historischen und regionalen Kontexten reden. Dabei geht es um verschiedene Perioden, die es zu unterscheiden gilt, aber auch um verschiedene Themen, die sich häufig wiederholen und bis in die Gegenwart von Moskau genutzt werden. Und in dieser kurzen Zeit, die ich zur Verfügung habe, wird es natürlich nur darum gehen, einige Highlights anzureißen, wenn Sie dann möchten, dass ich zu einzelnen Sachen noch mehr sage und mehr ins Detail gehe. Das ist natürlich jetzt mehr so eine Tour d'Horizon. Dann können wir das natürlich in der Diskussion äh, machen. Die große Frage ist natürlich am Ende dann auch, äh, die wir auch diskutieren sollten, wie groß ist eigentlich die, die, der Erfolg und die Wirkungsmacht äh, dieser Kampagnen am Ende noch ähm, und wie viel davon ist auch nur Theaterdonner vielleicht. Fangen wir ganz in der Gegenwart äh, an, obwohl ich ja Historiker bin, mit dem Genossen Sergei Lavrov äh, vor wenigen Tagen, ganz offiziell vertweetet von der äh, russischen äh, Botschaft. Ähm, ein Tweet über Russland und Deutschland, in dem Herr Lavrov, ähm, ich werde das jetzt nicht ganz vorlesen, äh, ausführt, historische Untersuchungen würden zeigen, also er nimmt äh, auf Historiker auch Bezug, dass es dem europäischen äh, Kontinent stets gut gegangen sei, wenn Deutschland und Russland über exzellente Beziehungen verfügten und gemeinsame Projekte verfolgen. Diese gute Ordnung in Europa werde jedoch immer wieder 
von ungenannten Mächten jenseits des Ärmelkanals und jenseits des Atlantiks äh, torpediert. So weit, so falsch, äh, möchte man sagen. Lavrov ähm, appelliert hier sozusagen ähm, an das, was ein Kollege äh, immer den inneren Hitler-Stalin-Pakt der Deutschen genannt hat, äh, den wir hier äh, offensichtlich wiederbeleben äh, sollen. Zugleich fordert er uns gewissermaßen ganz offen dazu auf, die ähm, Interessen der Osteuropäer vom Baltikum bis nach Südosteuropa zu ignorieren und suggeriert in bester karl schmidtscher tradition ähm, dass es eben die ähm, raumfremden Mächte, er benutzt das zwar nicht, aber er zeigt das ist doch eigentlich relativ deutlich, die raumfremden Mächte USA und Großbritannien seien, die sozusagen für die Konflikte in Europa ähm, äh, zur Verantwortung gezogen werden müssten und äh, ja, was, was sagt uns dieser Tweet, wenn wir das in eine historische Perspektive kurz äh, stellen zum Anfang dieses, dieses Panels? Er zeigt uns sozusagen zunächst einmal, glaube ich, die Kontinuitäten zum Kalten Krieg. Nicht? Also es ist ein altes Motiv äh, sowjetischer Propaganda zu versuchen, ähm, die Amerikaner oder die Westmächte äh, aus Mitteleuropa hinauszudrängen, äh, immer wieder zu behaupten, Amerika sei keine europäische Macht und es sei illegitim, dass die USA sich noch in Europa befänden und damit natürlich letztendlich einerseits ähm, die NATO und das transatlantische Bündnis zu unterminieren und andererseits sozusagen sich daran abzuarbeiten an der, an der Westbindung Deutschlands. Und das ist natürlich ein, eine Form von Propaganda, die wir äh, locker bis zum Ende der 40er Jahre ähm, und dem Beginn der Westbindung der Bundesrepublik ähm, zurückverfolgen können und die wir sozusagen wellenhaft dann gewissermaßen immer wieder ähm, erlebt haben ähm, seit dieser Zeit. Also eigentlich ein altes Motiv und ein Appell an Deutschland, die Sonderbeziehung zu Moskau die ja bekanntlich in der Zeitenwende von 2022 abgebrochen wurde, wieder aufzunehmen. Äh, letztendlich muss man natürlich sehen, ähm, dass Lavrov sich vielleicht auch etwas zu den äh, Zeiten von ähm, Herrn Schröder und Frau Merkel zurücksehnt, wo diese Narrative offensichtlich in unseren äh, Ämtern und äh, bei unserer Regierung und im Bundestag nicht ganz ohne Erfolg waren. Wenn man sieht, wie vehement beispielsweise Projekte wie Nord Stream 2 über Jahre äh, verteidigt wurden, als im europäischen Interesse und so weiter, ähm, dann sehen wir sozusagen, was vielleicht die Motivation von Herrn Lavrov sein könnte, ähm, darauf wieder äh, zu rekurrieren. Ja, wie sieht es mit den historischen Dimensionen aus? Ähm, Herr Voss bat mich, bei, bei Deutschland anzufangen. Das war ja auch, er hat es erwähnt, das Thema meiner ähm, Dissertation, äh, Freundschaftspropaganda für die Sowjetunion nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg in äh, Osteuropa und in der, in der DDR. Da ging es um den Stalin-Kult und so weiter, ähm, um die Eingliederung in das sowjetische Imperium, um diese Propaganda, die immer wieder die Überlegenheit des Sowjetischen ähm, äh, betonte. Und damals, ganz ehrlich gesagt, dachte ich, ich habe daran ungefähr gearbeitet von 1999 bis 2004, das sei tatsächlich ein historisches Thema und sowas würde nicht wiederkommen und all diese Narrative vom Stalin-Kult äh, äh, bis zu diesem äh, Kult des Zweiten Weltkriegs und so weiter und äh, äh, von Russland lernen oder der Sowjetunion heißt lieben ler siegen lernen und Friedenspropaganda und so, das seien eigentlich Dinge, die man jetzt noch einmal ähm, historisch seziert und dekonstruiert und aber eigentlich sei das vorbei. Äh, da war ich mir als Doktorand äh, ziemlich sicher und ähm, ja, die Amerikaner würden sagen, boy, was he wrong. Ähm, äh, wir sehen, dass vieles von dem natürlich wiedergekommen ist, was ich äh, damals äh, untersucht habe und dass sozusagen ähm, diese, diese Propaganda ähm, und viele ihrer Motive unter Putin wieder aufgetaucht sind ähm, in verschiedenen regionalen äh, Kontexten. Ähm, und wenn wir sozusagen uns die Demonstrationen und die öffentliche Stimmung teilweise in Ostdeutschland zum Beispiel anschauen, aber nicht nur dort, ähm, dann müssen wir vielleicht auch nochmal anders über die Wirkungsmacht dieser Propaganda über Generationen hinweg äh, reden und äh, sozusagen die Frage Sowjetunion als Friedensmacht, Russland als Friedensmacht, ist da nicht vielleicht doch mehr hängen geblieben, als ich mir damals eingebildet habe? Und war das vielleicht doch erfolgreicher und nicht so ein großes Scheitern, äh, wie Herr Voss noch einleitend sagte, ähm, wie man sich das sozusagen damals Ende der 90er, Anfang der 2000er Jahre so zusammengereimt hat? So viel zum, zum Thema ähm, äh, 
Ostdeutschland äh, und ähm, Freundschaftspropaganda im Sozialismus. Wie gesagt, wir müssen ja schnell durch diese ganzen Sachen durchkommen, um hier aber nicht nur sozusagen ähm, Ostdeutschland oder ähm, DDR-Bashing zu betreiben, sollte man natürlich auch über Westdeutschland äh, kurz reden zumindest und äh, vor allen Dingen dann natürlich über das wiedervereinigte Deutschland, denn hier sind auf, ganz offensichtlich ja die größten Fehler gemacht worden in den vergangenen Jahrzehnten. Und ähm, ich sage ganz offen und will das auch gar nicht groß begründen, dass ich natürlich weiterhin ein großer Unterstützer äh, der branchen Ostverträge von äh, Moskau, äh, Warschau und Berlin sind. Das war ein großer äh, Schritt für die deutsche Außenpolitik im äh, Kalten Krieg und das sehe ich nach wie vor uneingeschränkt äh, positiv. Was man allerdings sehen muss, glaube ich, ist die moralische Überhöhung dieser Ostpolitik, ihre Erstarrung zu einem Mythos, ihre Erstarrung zu so einer Art Patentrezept im Umgang mit Russland. Man müsse nur lange genug mit denen reden, dann ähm, werde sich schon alles fügen. Ähm, das sind, glaube ich, äh, die Dinge, wo die Probleme anfangen, schon Ende der 70er Jahre mit Solidarność ähm, und dann natürlich auch die Frage der wirtschaftlichen, äh, insbesondere energiewirtschaftlichen Verflechtung äh, mit der Sowjetunion und Russland. Und auch das geht zurück bis in die bis in die 70er Jahre mit den Röhrengeschäften. Wie Sie wissen, das ist nicht nur die Frage von Nord Stream ähm, 1 und 2. Und viele Teile dieser deutschen Ostpolitik sind am Ende in Floskeln erstarrt, glaube ich, die dann immer wieder wiederholt wurden. Ich will nur äh, eine solche Floskel nennen, die ich mir auch selber als Kritiker dieser Politik, ich habe das ja spätestens seit 2014 auch sehr öffentlich kritisiert, Nord Stream und so weiter, anhören musste, war natürlich immer, es gäbe in Europa keinen Frieden ohne Russland. Heute hat man eher das Gefühl, es gibt vor allen Dingen keinen Frieden mit Russland. Aber damals war das auch einer dieser Kalendersprüche, den die deutsche Politik gerne aufgesagt hat, ohne sich weiter mit Russland zu beschäftigen. Und die blinden Flecken, denke ich, waren eben insbesondere Osteuropa, Polen, das Baltikum, aber besonders auch natürlich die Ukraine, die uns viel zu wenig interessiert hat und die lange ein, ein sozusagen schwarzer Fleck war ähm, auf der deutschen ähm, Mental Map. Und letztlich, wenn wir heute zurückschauen auf die Ära Schröder-Merkel, müssen wir sagen, und das ist ein bitteres Fazit, denke ich, dass sich Deutschland an Russlands negativer Ukraine-Politik aktiv, passiv beteiligt hat, sie auch finanziert hat. Und damit auch nicht ganz unverantwortlich ist für diese Situation, die wir tatsächlich im Osten Europas vorfinden. Und wir müssen uns dann nochmal auch fragen, wie viel das sozusagen mit erfolgreicher Kulturdiplomatie zu tun hat. Es ist noch nicht so lange her, da tobte die ganze Berliner äh, Elite für eine ganze Nacht immer beim großen Ball in der äh, russischen Botschaft äh, unter den Linden und feierte da auch zu Zeiten, als Putin schon längst Kriegsverbrechen anderswo begangen war, die deutsch-russische äh, Freundschaft, da gibt es, glaube ich, das sei nur in aller Kürze gesagt, viel aufzuarbeiten. Ähm, kommen wir nochmal zu dem, zu dem größeren Kontext. Äh, jetzt habe ich noch fünf Minuten, oh je. Ähm, nicht, es beschränkt sich natürlich nicht alles auf Polen und, und Deutschland und die Sachen, wozu ich äh, gearbeitet habe, sondern diese gesamten Motive russischer äh, Kulturdiplomatie, russischer Propaganda finden wir natürlich auch innerhalb des äh, Imperiums. Hier sehen Sie, wer schon mal in Kiew war, kennt es vielleicht, das äh, Monument der Völkerfreundschaft in, in Kiew. Gemeint ist hier natürlich jetzt die Freundschaft zwischen äh, Russland und der, und der Ukraine und dieses bereits nach 2014 aufgenommen, als die Ukrainer dann eben so einen symbolischen Riss in dieses Denkmal äh, gemacht haben. Mittlerweile wird, glaube ich, auch darüber gesprochen, das ganz wegzuhauen. Ähm, auch hier sozusagen sehen wir aber, dass das ganz ähnlich funktioniert, nicht? denn die Freundschaft zwischen Russland und äh, der Ukraine ist auch immer als eine asymmetrische Beziehung äh, gedacht. Ähm, die, die berühmten Brudervölker, von denen ja bis heute auch immer die Rede äh, war, ähm, bedeuteten immer, dass es einen großen und einen kleinen äh, Bruder gab und dass man über die russischen Verbrechen in der Ukraine nicht reden sollte, dass das Ukrainische letztlich zur Folklore-Sprache oder zur Folklore-Kultur heruntergestuft wurde. Und auch da hat sich nach 1991 wenig geändert, nicht? Auf die, auf die Anerkennung der ukrainischen Grenzen in Budapest in dem berühmten ähm, Memorandum von 1994 folgte eben schon bald die Doktrin des nahen Auslands. 
Was meinten die Russen mit dem nahen Ausland? Äh, nicht, das ist schon zur Jelzin-Zeit, nicht erst zur Putin-Zeit empfunden worden. Das bedeutete eigentlich, dass es um Russland herum so etwas gibt wie eine Zone beschränkter Souveränität, dass zumindest dort die Ordnung von Yalta wiederhergestellt werden sollte, die man eben 1989 in Mitteleuropa und in Ostdeutschland äh, verloren hatte. Und ähm, das haben wir, glaube ich, auch lange ignoriert. Die ständigen Eingriffe Moskaus in die ukrainische ähm, Innenpolitik, äh, sowohl was Soft- oder Hardpower äh, anging, ähm, ich nenne hier jetzt nur stellvertretend aus Zeitgründen den Namen Viktor Medvedchuk, der ja erst vor kurzem aus der Ukraine äh, geflohen oder ausgetauscht worden ist nach seiner äh, Festnahme dann äh, und äh, der praktisch symbolisch äh, als Statthalter Moskaus äh, da über Jahrzehnte äh, großen Schaden angerichtet, angerichtet hat. Ähm, ja, dieses ganze Weltbild, was sich dann unter Putin wieder weiter radikalisiert hat, findet seinen vielleicht interessantesten Ausdruck in dem Fürst, oh, der ist hier falsch geschrieben, der heißt natürlich nicht Waldimir, sondern Wladimir, denk mal, am Roten Platz. Ähm, na, so, Waldemar vielleicht, ja. Wladimir auf, auf äh, Ukrainisch, vielleicht ist das gemeint, das ist das ein, ein netter ukrainischer Student, der die PowerPoint gemacht hat, natürlich meine Schuld, dass ich das nicht nochmal durchgeguckt habe. Ähm, da sehen Sie sozusagen symbolisch äh, reproduziert die gesamte russische Geschichtspolitik, äh, ähm, die eben nicht nur die Deutungshoheit über die sowjetische Zeit beansprucht und über das Zarenreich seit Peter, sondern die Deutungshoheit sozusagen Russlands äh, geht natürlich ähm, über die ganzen tausend Jahre. Und da haben wir dann sozusagen, das kann ich jetzt natürlich nur anreißen, auch den Streit um die Kiewer Rus und sozusagen wem, die Kiewer Rus eigentlich gehört und ob wir sozusagen diese Translatio Imperii von Kiew nach Moskau, ähm, so wie ich die auch noch in den 1990er Jahren an der Freien Universität gelernt habe, ähm, ob wir die nicht mal anfangen sollten zu hinterfragen und auch einen ukrainischen oder einen belarussischen Blick äh, auf die Geschichte ähm, Russlands und der Sowjetunion äh, zulassen, nachdem wir, ähm, und das ist wiederum kritisch, natürlich auch an die, an die eigene deutsche Osteuropa-Wissenschaft ähm, ne, adressiert, nachdem wir lange genug ähm, den imperialen russischen Narrativ relativ unkritisch zu großen Teilen, es gibt Kollegen, die Ausnahmen sind, wiedergekäut haben und unseren Studenten vorgesetzt haben. Ja. Es gibt auch eine andere Erzählung als bei Karamsin und Klutschewski und wir sollten ähm, uns trauen, selbstkritisch auch sozusagen die Dekolonialisierung unseres eigenen Blicks ähm, voranzutreiben und nicht diese Heilsgeschichte zu erzählen, die eben dieses Denkmal auf dem äh, Roten Platz erzählt, dass Russland praktisch in der Ukraine gegründet wurde und dass es deswegen auch mit der Taufe eine Art geradezu geheiligten Anspruch auf, diese, auf diesen Raum gebe. Das ist natürlich Unsinn. Jetzt muss ich zum Schluss kommen, es ist auch zum Glück die letzte Folie. Damit wollte ich so einmal überleiten nach Südosteuropa, weil das ja hier das Treffen der Südosteuropa-Gesellschaft ist. Ein weiteres, glaube ich, Merkmal dieser russischen Kulturpropaganda, wo es sich lohnt, darüber zu diskutieren, vielleicht später in der Diskussion, ist eben auch der Panslavismus, der natürlich im 19. Jahrhundert schon begann, im Ersten Weltkrieg eingesetzt wurde, aber was wenige wissen, auch von Stalin im Zweiten Weltkrieg ganz stark, gerade was in Bezug auf Jugoslawien und die CSSR betont wurde. Und hier kommt es dann beides zusammen im Panslavismus, natürlich den, der, der, die Orthodoxie, nicht, die wir eben mit dem Wladimir-Denkmal hatten, und, ähm, und dann die, die Kulturdiplomatie, die vermeintlich harmlose ähm, Sprachgeschichten äh, des äh, Panslavismus, wo man aber, wenn man genauer hinschaut, auch schaut, was wird hier vermittelt in russischer Kulturdiplomatie? Ein strikt antiwestliches Denken, ein völkisches Denken, wo es darum geht, sozusagen gemeinsames Blut, vermeintliche gemeinsame Herkunft äh, zu betonen. Anti-EU, antiwestliche Werte, antiwestliche Menschenrechte, gemeinsame Werte mit Putin und wiederum der Versuch, kulturelle Hegemonie zu erreichen und Deutungshoheit zu gewinnen und so letztlich den imperialen, ähm, Anspruch äh, Russlands ähm, nicht nur ähm, auf den postsowjetischen Raum ähm, auszudrücken, sondern dann auch eben äh, auf Teile des Balkans. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Vielen Dank, Herr Behrens. Und äh, wir würden direkt weitermachen mit äh, Professor Tatjana Petzer zu Russlands postsowjetischer Balkan-Imagologie.
Äh, auch ich möchte mich für die Einladung äh, bedanken, hier sprechen zu dürfen und sende Christian liebe Genesungsgrüße. Mein kurzer Vortrag heute ist, muss zu Beginn doch einschränkend gesagt werden, dem russisch-sowjetischen und postsowjetisch-russischen Balkanbild gewidmet. Also ich gehe nicht auf die Peripherien ein die diese das ba den Balkan für sich konstruiert haben. Und auch wenn sich das äh, Toponym Balkan, russisch Balkane, ein Plural wie das englische Balkans, wenn also der Balkan, was in dieser Runde nicht weiter erläutert werden muss, sich aus einer Vielzahl von Ländern mit Zugehörigkeit zu diversen Sprachfamilien zusammensetzt, wird mein Augen, Hauptaugenmerk auf der südslawisch balkanischen Imagologie liegen und das sehr allgemein. Also ich werde weder auf Banja Luka oder noch einen anderen Ort konkret eingehen, ähm, wie ähm, Christian Voss das in der Einleitung gesagt hat. Zeitlich fokussiere ich insbesondere die Zäsuren von 1945 und den Zusammenbruch der kommunistischen Staatenbündnisse. Dennoch möchte ich auf die Frage von äh, Christian Voss, die er im Exposé zu diesem Symposium zu Recht aufgeworfen hat, ähm, ob in Russland derselbe westliche Balkanismus vorherrsche, den Maria Todorova beschrieben hat, eine Antwort versuchen oder vielleicht an dieser Stelle nur auf die erklärte Rolle Russland als Prokurator der orthodoxen Balkanslawen seit dem ausgehenden 18. Jahrhundert sowie auf die russische Literatur der zweiten Hälfte des 19. Jahrhunderts verweisen, die vor dem Hintergrund aktueller Ereignisse neuer Aufmerksamkeit erfahren. Beispielsweise sind Ivan Turgenevs Roman, Roman Nakanuni am Vorabend von 1860 oder Jeftal Stoys Anna Karenina von 1878 prominente Beispiele dafür, dass im zaristischen Russland ein ausgeprägter eigener Balkanismus vorherrschte, der sich von westlichen Balkankonstruktionen unterschied. So nimmt bei Turgenev der bulgarische Held unter der gestaltenden Hand eines russischen Bildhauers die Physiognomie eines Hammels an. Und bei Tolstoi wird der Balkan zum schwarzen Loch, in dem Menschen verschwinden. Zu solchen wechselseitigen Projektionen, Crossing Projections von Balkan und Russland sei auf Tanja Zimmermanns Konstanze Habilitationsschrift verwiesen, publiziert 2014 unter dem Titel Der Balkan zwischen Ost und West, mediale Bilder und kulturpolitische Prägungen. Im 20. Jahrhundert tritt neben die imaginären Projektionen und Landkarten des Nation Building, der Malerei und der Literatur die fotografische und filmische Visualisierung. Die erste Folie zeigt den jüdisch-russischen Maler und Kriegsfotografen Samson Tchernow, der 1887 bis 1929 lebte, aus Rezan stammte und seit 1912 im Auftrag russischer Tagesblätter die Balkankriege und den Ersten Weltkrieg im europäischen Südosten mit ca. 500 Fotos dokumentierte. Nach der Oktoberrevolution verschiebt sich zwar die Grundlage des russischen Anspruchs auf die panslawistischen Führungs-, auf die panslawistische Führungsrolle von religionskulturellen, hin zu ideologischen Aspekten, doch gestaltet sich dieser weiterhin imperial und voller Unkenntnisse und Negation von Alterität von russischer Seite, unabhängig von der Verwurzelung der eigenen Schriftkultur in den Südslawia und Südosteuropa. Wir hatten auf der letzten Folie gerade Method und Kirill gesehen. Sympathien des neuen sowjetischen Staates erntete das dreieinige Königreich Jugoslawien in der Zwischenkriegszeit nicht, da es in den 20er und 30er Jahren des 20. Jahrhunderts nicht nur Flüchtlinge des Bürgerkriegs aufnimmt, sondern auch die geflüchteten Überreste der Weißen Armee. Im Zweiten Weltkrieg und dem kommunistischen Umbruch auf dem Balkan kommt es dann zu einer Annäherung qua Usurpation. Das 1946 im Studio Mosfilm produzierte Filmdrama 
в горах Югославии, в горах Югославии, показывает дем Балканхелден в рукоständigen Шафспельц, который jedoch nach dem Vorbild des Sowjets zusehen in einen neuen Menschen verwandelt. Technisch wird dies durch eine dynamische Überblendung mit Zeitraffen der Kriegshandlung inszeniert und der Mensch verwandelt sich gerade seine Kopfbedeckung wird äh, ganz auffällig in einen kommunistischen Helden ähm, nicht mutiert, wollte ich jetzt gerade sagen, aber naja, transformiert. Im Fazit können die Jugoslawen nur mit den Sowjets an der Seite die Aggressoren besiegen, womit der historisch eigenständige Sieg der Tito-Partisanen negiert wird. Der Befreiungsmythos wird mit Balkan-Klischees komplementiert. Nach dem Vorbild des serbischen Attentäters von Sarajevo, Gavrilo Princip, erschießt ein Gymnasialschüler mitten auf der Straße einen hohen deutschen Befehlshaber. Die karge Berglandschaft und eine orientalisierte Kulisse mit verschleierten Frauen bildet die Szenerie des Partisankampfes. Nun, äh, der Schafspelz erinnert aber auch an Georgien und an die Verwandlung Stalins sowie an dessen jugoslawischen Doppelgänger, könnte man sagen, an Tito. Diese Ambivalenz ist dem sowjetischen Balkanismus, der das eigene Anderssein im Europa im Film dupliziert, inhärent. Ilja Ehrenburg, befreit in seinem 1947 erschienenen Reisebericht Darogi Evropi, die Wege Europas, das kommunistische Jugoslawien, das nunmehr nach sowjetischem Muster lebt, zumindest verbal vom Balkan-Klischee. Ich zitiere, eins war der, das Wort Balkan ein Synonym der national, für nationale Feindschaft, Puderkriege, Palastrevolution, Ignoranz und Wildheit der Sitten. Diese Zeiten sind vorbei. Der Balkan erhebt jetzt eine Epoche des kulturellen Aufstiegs, des geistigen Glühens, des Schöpfertums und wenn noch irgendein Balkan im früheren Sinne dieses Wortes existiert, so bestimmt nicht hier auf dem Balkan. Zitat Ende. Bekanntlich zogen Tito und der jugoslawische Partisanenstolz Stalins Kalkül einen Strich durch die Rechnung, was den Befreiungsmythos und dessen geopolitische Pläne auf dem Balkan betraf. Die Balkanisierung Osteuropas nahm Fahrtwind auf und trieb mit der blockfreien Bewegung ein Keil in Richtung Süden, in das territoriale Ost-West-Konstrukt, deren Einflusssphären zu Kriegsende zwischen Stalin und Churchill ausgehandelt wurden. Solange Stalin noch lebte, wurde Tito mit Stereotypen Feindattributen in Wort und Bild diskreditiert, wie die anti-jugoslawischen Karikaturen sowjetischer Provenienz auf der Folie zeigen. Diese Epoche der bilateralen Geschichte jenseits des eisernen Vor Hangs ist jüngst in den Fokus der akademischen Aufmerksamkeit getreten. Für den sowjetischen Durchschnittsbürger aber war Jugoslawien ein Mysterium kapitalistischer Marktwirtschaft. Mit der Liberalisierung der Beziehungen nach Stalins Tod wurde durch ein Stück wurde auch ein Stück der idyllischen Konsum- und Tourismusprojektion von Jugoslawien in die Sowjetunion exportiert. Vergleichsweise teure, aber auch qualitativ überzeugende jugoslawische Waren wurden unter anderem im Moskauer Kaufhaus Jadran, Adria, verkauft. Ich habe leider kein Bild von dem Kaufhaus gefunden, aber ähm, hier ein vergleichsweises ähm, Kaufhaus Belgrad oder Belgrad. Eine Urlaubsreise ans adriatische Mittelwehr war nicht vielen Sowjetbürgern vergönnt. Doppelt so viele schafften es nach Ungarn und mindestens dreimal so viele nach Bulgarien. Hier vollzieht sich der intendierte Imagewechsel Südslawiens vom Balkan, dem Bergvolk, zur offenen Mittelmeerkultur. Ein weiteres Bild, das Tito beflügelte, war die politische Funktion der Jagd unter den Ostblock- und blockfreien Staaten, die zur unabdingbaren Geflogenheit in der sowjetischen, nicht der sowjetischen, dort auch, aber in der gesamten sozialistischen Diplomatie avancierte. Man könnte auch über die Symbolkraft von Titus erlegten Bären nachdenken, wodurch der Bär mit Russland assoziiert wird. Der russische Präsident ist in den 
sozialen Medien als Jäger omnipräsent. Seine Medienberater scheinen Putin in diesem Punkt auf Titus Sonderweg eingeschworen zu haben, um das persönliche Charisma, körperliche Fitness und neuerdings ökologisches Engagement zu beschwören. Und auch als Hundeliebhaber gewinnt Putin die Sympathien seiner Wählerschaft. In den Jahren 1998, 99, als Russland aus der eigenen sich aus der eigenen Stagnation erholte, wendete es sich den Serben mit größerer Aufmerksam zu. Von nun an geisterte der Mythos der slawischen Brüderlichkeit und besonderer Beziehung zwischen Russland und dem Balkan durch Wissenschaft und Medien. In der Populärkultur bildete sich seit dem Erscheinen von Boris Akunjans Kriminal- und Spionageroman Tulieski Gambit, das Tür äh, türkisches Gambit, der im Kriegsjahr 1877 angesiedelt ist, 1998 erschien und 2005 als Verfilmung zu sehen war, die Balkanfront zur Zeit des serbisch-osmanischen und russisch-osmanischen Krieges, ein beliebtes Historiensetting bis hin zu Svetlana Savitskaya's Balkan-Roman, für den sie ausführlich in Militär- und lokalen Archiven Bulgariens recherchiert hatte. 20 Jahre nach dem Kosovo-Krieg und der Bombardierung Serbiens durch die NATO erinnerte die russisch-serbische Koproduktion Balkanski Rubirs Balkanlein an die Aktion des russischen Militärs vor den NATO-Einheiten, dem Flughafen, in Pristina einzunehmen und so seine Präsenz in der kosovo Forest zu sichern. Das hier geteilte Bild des Schulterschlusses am Balkan, der slawischen Waffenbrüderschaft, ist ebenso skandalös wie bedrohlich. Serbien wurde für Russland nach der Verhängung von Wirtschaftssanktionen gegen Russland im Jahre 2014 als der Rubel gegen den Euro stark fiel und Reisen nach Westeuropa für viele und unerschwinglich wurden, zum Tourismusmagneten. Das Nachrichtenportal Balkanist unterstützte die positive, die positive, das positive Balkan-Image mit dem Kernland Serbien, das für seine aufrichtigen, aufrichtige Russofolie, für seinen Rakia natürlich, die Natur, und seine christlich-orthodoxen Pilgerstätten bekannt wurde. Und für die jungen Leute bedeutet Balkan, bedeutet Balkan Party, Balkan Brass Music und Filme à la Kusturica. Das ist also eine ganz normale globale Erscheinung. Zu diesem Nachrichtenportal, vielleicht kennt es der ein oder andere, es gibt es noch in Russisch und in äh, Serbisch, ist nicht ver, zu verwechseln mit dem englischsprachigen Balkanisten. Und ähm, hier zum Beispiel eine, ähm, eine Information über die neuen Russen in äh, Serbien, auf die ich gleich zurückkommen werde. Und äh, ganz prominent auch ein Interview mit Kusturice natürlich. Wie Russlands postsowjetischer Balkanismus ausfällt, hängt heute davon ab, aus welcher Perspektive und Position heraus argumentiert wird. Ist es die Wissenschaftscommunity, die in den letzten 10 bis 15 Jahren die Fragen der russländischen Balkanimagologie aufzuarbeiten begonnen hat? Oder sind es eben die neuen Russen, die ihre die ihr Business im Serbien eröffnen wollen und sich über Langwierigkeiten und Unwägbarkeiten ärgern und einige Balkanstereotype aufleben lassen. Oder, und damit möchte ich schließen, versucht ein russischer Autor wie der in Prag lebende Andriy Schade den Balkan und dessen byzantinisch-osmanisches Erbe durch die europäische Brille zu verstehen. Also mit jenen Balkanismus, den Todorova interpretiert hat. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, Frau Petzer. Ähm, Frau Petzer und Herr Behrens, ich würde Sie nach vorne bitten und das Publikum äh, direkt um Handzeichen für die Fragen in der ersten Fragerunde. Wir haben jetzt ungefähr zehn Minuten Zeit. Ich würde sagen, wir sammeln ein paar Fragen und äh, können die dann... Äh, 
nacheinander beantworten von beiden äh, Vortragenden. Frau Steinacker sehe ich schon und genau, alle anderen überlegen noch und melden sich dann gleich. Ähm, genau, äh, das Mikrofon hat Frau Ritz oder Frau Schomogi. Ja. Äh, Sie erwähnten Frau Petzer, also zunächst mal vielen Dank für beide Vorträge, aber Sie erwähnten, was sehr interessant ist über die, die weißrussische Armee, die Flüchtlinge, die dann auf den Balkan gelangt sind oder in das dann zwischen entstandene Königreich Jugoslawien. Gibt es darüber mehr Literatur? Denn es waren ja nicht nur Militärs, es waren ja sehr viele Akademiker, die äh, dort in diesen Entwicklungsstaat gekommen sind. Ich denke nur an Georgi Ostrogorski, der die Byzantinistik in äh, Jugoslawien bzw. Belgrad begründet hat. Ähm, aber überall, also ich habe die Spuren auch in Mazedonien gefunden, Gräber von ähm, russischen Mönchen, die dort dann in Klöstern gelandet sind und man kann diese Gräber da finden. Oder Ivan, äh, Ivan Milovan Gilas schildert in seinen Jugenderinnerungen, äh, dass er in Bielopolje, wo er das Gymnasium besucht hat, äh, russische Lehrer hatte, auch Flüchtlinge vor der Revolution. Und da würde mich sehr interessieren, gibt es dazu mehr Literatur? Ich glaube, dass dieser Einfluss vor allen Dingen im östlichen Teil Jugoslawiens, also in Serbien, äh, Mazedonien, Montenegro, äh, nicht unterschätzt werden kann. Vielen Dank. Und ähm, wir können noch zwei Fragen nehmen, denke ich. Bitte nochmal um das Handzeichen, wer noch eine Frage anschließen möchte. Sonst würden wir erstmal diese Frage an Frau Petzer beantworten. Ja, es gibt eine, ähm, es gibt eine ähm, Publikation, ähm, Jovanovic heißt der Autor, wenn ich mich richtig erinnere, die sowohl in serbischer Sprache als auch in russischer Sprache vorliegt und diese Immigration von den 20er und 30er Jahren sehr ausführlich beschreibt. Also es ist erstens ein, ja, eine sehr große Ausnahme, dass ein Land bereit war, eine Armee aufzunehmen. Ich glaube, keine, kein, kein Staat war in dieser Zeit oder wird jemals bereit sein, irgendwie eine zerschlagene, immigrierende ähm, ja, Wucht ja, an, an militärischer Kraft aufzunehmen. Das ist das Erste. Man ist sich auch darüber einig, dass vielleicht drei Prozent dieser ganzen Immigration ähm, der ungebildeten Schicht angehörte. Also ein, wirklich ein sehr geringer Prozentsatz und dass mit dieser Migration natürlich hochgebildete und ausgebildete ähm, Ingenieure, Architekten, Ärzte, alles, alles kam, die sehr, also sehr äh, praktisch das die Zukunft dann geprägt haben, auch das Stadtbild äh, Belgrads. Also da kann ich Ihnen nur Recht geben und ähm, ähm, ja, äh, auf diese Publikation verweisen, wo das weiter äh, ausdifferenziert ist. Ich habe einen äh, Doktoranden in Frankfurt, der sich ähm, äh, mit den Militärs beschäftigt, die emigriert sind nach dem Ende des Bürgerkriegs. Wenn jemand das interessiert, äh, sozusagen, gebe ich ja gern den den Namen raus. Das ist tatsächlich eine interessante Geschichte, weil einige von denen dann eben auch auf Seiten der Wehrmacht gekämpft haben. Andere sind aber sozusagen wiederum auf serbischer Seite dann aufgetreten im Zweiten Weltkrieg. Ist also auch keine Geschichte, die Anfang der 20er Jahre endet, sondern tatsächlich eine Geschichte, die man bis in den Kalten Krieg rein erzählen kann. Dann äh, sich die Hand von Tobias Flessenkämper und wir, ich würde dann sammeln danach, genau, aber Tobias ja. erstmal. Danke Christian, vielen Dank für die beiden hervorragenden Vorträge. Kurze Frage, Herr Behrens, Sie haben angedeutet Aufarbeitung ähm, der Kulturdiplomatie und ihres Einflusses. Wie könnte eine solche Aus Aufarbeitung aussehen? Also vielleicht im Fall Bundesrepublik Deutschland, aber vielleicht auch für Frau Petzert. Ähm, wie könnte das zum Beispiel auch in einer Diskussion in, in Serbien oder in, auf dem Balkan aussehen? Ähm, das wäre meine Frage. Vielen Dank. Und ich habe vergessen, bitte stellen Sie sich vielleicht ganz kurz vor, wenn Sie die Frage stellen. Genau, Tobias Flessenkemper, Leiter des Europaratsbüros in Belgrad. Und hier hatte ich eine Hand noch gesehen. Ja, Zidilko ist mein Name. Ich wollte nur was sagen, eben die Frage von Frau Steinacker und was wir gehört haben, also über die Beziehung, also so zu der Aufarbeitung eines Teils, also diesen... Einfluss ist dieser historischen Geschehnisse. Wenn man auf die kulturelle Seite also hinguckt, also da sind jetzt 
meines Wissens, also seit über 20 Jahren, sehr viele Projekte gestartet worden, dass man auch eben äh, diese kulturelle Seite, diese künstlerische Seite aufarbeitet. Äh, so sind etwa Archivuntersuchungen in Wirtschaft zum Beispiel, also es gab ja auch Zeitschriften und so weiter, äh, also getätigt worden und zum Beispiel neulich ist ein serbischer Dichter, sagen wir mal, <lacht> russischer Herkunft, also äh, verstorben, also so ein sehr wichtiger, äh, sehr wichtiger Dichter, Sascha Petrov, also Alexander Petrov, der auch in Serbien also äh, geboren ist und auch viel also gedichtet hat, übersetzt hat aus dem Russischen, aber auch in, auf Russisch äh, geschrieben hat und eben in Bezug also auf seine Tätigkeit dabei hat es auch initiiert, dass auch sehr viele andere Autoren, sehr viele andere Leute also nun also jetzt Gehör finden, also da also ist man dran interessiert, also es wird auch sehr viel gemacht, also so was diese Seite anbelangt. Russische. Ja, russische, die, die Weißen ne, sozusagen, ne, Belirussi. Ne. Hm, danke. Und äh, Dimitar Betschew. Ja, the question in, uh, in English, uh, Entschuldigung. Um, <laughs> It's a small footnote there, if you're interested in the diaspora, I mean, there is a great book about Istanbul in the early 20s, uh, Midnight in Para Palace, that Charles King wrote. Of course, Istanbul was where the Wrangel army um, was evacuated first from Crimea, and it became a hub for resettlement later on, but it's a, it's a great narrative. And I'm pretty sure there's lots of literature in Bulgarian because there are white Russians there. But my question is about this idea of uh, the exotic other, and the, the Balkanism narrative. In the Russian context, um, you could probably draw a parallel to the Caucasus, because this looms large in the literary imaginaire um, over a long time, um, both within but also different. So I was just wondering if in your studies you made this parallel comparison and how does the Balkans and the Caucasus compare in in the narrative production and the cultural imaginary. Okay, thank you very much, Dimitar. Is there any other question? Gernot Erler, final one. Berens, ich möchte gerne an Sie eine Frage stellen. Sie sind kritisch umgegangen mit der deutschen Russland- und Ostpolitik und haben sie als fehlerhaft hier dargestellt. Aber da würde mich mal interessieren, ab wann das begonnen hat aus Ihrer Sicht. Denn war das schon falsch, 2001 Wladimir Putin im Deutschen Bundestag reden zu lassen? War es falsch, mit Mitri Medvedev eine Modernisierungspartnerschaft auszuhandeln? Oder ist es erst falsch gewesen, zu versuchen, mit dem Normandie-Format eine Friedenslösung für das Problem Ukraine zu finden? Einige sagen ja heute, das war nur ein Versuch. Zeit zu gewinnen, um die Ukraine aufzurüsten. Da würde mich interessieren, wann, wann fingen die Fehler oder Naivitäten an aus Ihrer Sicht? Vielen Dank. Ähm, genau, wir haben, wir haben jetzt noch so ungefähr fünf Minuten. Ähm, die Fragen waren äh, Aufarbeitung der Kulturdiplomatie. Wie könnte das aussehen? Ähm, wir haben äh, Caucasus and Balkans. Ist there a similar narrative about them? Und äh, ab wann fingen die, die Fehler an in der, äh, in der deutschen Russlandpolitik? Ich gebe das mal weiter. Okay. <lacht> ja, ähm, vielen Dank. Ähm, äh, ich mache in der sozusagen, äh, Sprache der jeweiligen Frage. Ähm, zur Frage der Aufarbeitung. Ich glaube sozusagen, ähm, dass man sich da tatsächlich verschiedene Komplexe anschauen muss. Nicht? Ich habe ja auch äh, selbstkritisch über die Wissenschaft äh, gesprochen. Ich glaube, wir müssen in der Wissenschaft gucken, ähm, wie wir das aufbrechen können, sozusagen unsere Russland-Fixierung, äh, die wir lange in unserer Ausbildung gehabt haben. Ich habe da selber äh, versucht, was zu unternehmen, schon 2014 nach dem Maidan durch die Gründung von Prisma Ukraina, weil wir damals festgestellt haben, dass man in ganz Berlin, Brandenburg äh, kein Ukrainisch äh, lernen konnte. Es äh, nichts gab zu ukrainischer Sprache, Kultur, Geschichte und so weiter. Aber das war natürlich nur ein sehr bescheidener Anfang. Äh, da muss die gesamte deutsche Osteuropa-Wissenschaft sich auf den Prüfstand stellen und gucken, wo wir sozusagen russische Narrative verbreitet haben und einen kolonialen Blick auf diese Region ähm, weiter perpetuiert haben. Ähm, ob die Wirtschaft ihre Verflechtung aufarbeiten will, weiß ich nicht. Das wäre natürlich ein anderer sozusagen interessanter ähm, Aspekt. 
Und ich gehöre tatsächlich zu den Leuten, äh, manche wissen es ja, ich bin in der Historischen Kommission der ähm, SPD, äh, die innerhalb der SPD sich für eine Enquete-Kommission im Deutschen Bundestag einsetzen, so wie es sie jetzt zu Afghanistan gibt, dass sie auch zur Russlandpolitik gemacht werden sollte. Da sehr viele deutsche Karrieren allerdings an der Russlandpolitik hängen, bin ich mir nicht so sicher, ob diese Enquete-Kommission kommen würde. Ich glaube allerdings, dass sie interessante Resultate bringen würde. Und insbesondere, und das ist ein ernster Punkt, ähm, uns in, in Hinblick auf China auch vielleicht weiterhelfen würde, dieselben Fehler nicht nochmal wiederzumachen oder auch im Hin Hinblick auf den Iran. Ähm, es sind äh, sozusagen noch weitere Herausforderungen. Russland ist nicht das Ende äh, der Fahnenstange, auch wenn wir das glauben. Uh, ganz kurz, uh, very, very quickly to, to Dimit. Yeah. Um, it's not only Caucasus, actually. Actually, Ukrainians are also portrayed in this way as Cossacks and as the, the people from Dikoyopolye, you know, from the, from the wild steppes. And if you look at, for example, during Stalinism, I had a student who, who wrote about the um, image of um, Ukrainians in Stalinist propaganda. They are um, shown exactly in the, in the same way, often with very Turkic uh, elements, um, also as, as the exotic others. Um, it's not only in the in the Caucasus can also be Slavic people, which is very interesting, and we can ask ourselves why that is um, the case. Um, und zu Herrn Erler, naja, das liegt natürlich im Auge des Betrachters. Ich würde sagen, sozusagen schon bei Solidarność ist einiges falsch gelaufen, wenn ich mir die Aussagen von, von Egon Barr über Polen dazu dann nochmal angeschaut habe, ähm, ist es ziemlich gruselig. Ähm, wenn wir uns jetzt mal nur auf Putin beschränken, dann würde ich sagen, ich bin ich in der Lage, das zu kritisieren, dass er in den Bundestag eingeladen wurde. Das würde ich mir auch nicht anmaßen. Das Problem ist, glaube ich, dass man ihm als KGB-Agenten dann alles geglaubt hat, was er da gesagt hat, sozusagen. Und er noch mit Standing Ovations aus dem Hohen Haus verabschiedet wurde. Da, da fängt das Unkritische sicherlich an. Und dann, dass man eben die Gewalt ignoriert hat. Also sozusagen alles, was wir heute sehen in Mariupol, in Butscha, ähm, in, ähm, äh, in Cherson, ähm, das gibt es doch alles schon in Tschetschenien. Die Geiselnahmen, die Massenvergewaltigung, die Auslöschung von Städten aus der Luft. Wenn man Bilder von Grosny gesehen hat, 2001, 2002, übrigens genau zu der Zeit, als Putin im Bundestag gesprochen hat, das gibt es doch schon seit 20 Jahren, das ist doch nicht neu. Das ist doch die große sozusagen ähm, selbst äh, sozusagen Täuschung gewesen hier, ähm, dass man das nicht hat wahrnehmen wollen. Und ich weiß noch, wie damals in den 2000er Jahren meine ukrainischen Freunde zu mir sagten, wie gut, dass die Russen da so beschäftigt sind in Tschetschenien, dann haben sie ja nicht auf die Idee, hier was anzustellen. Und damals fand ich das ehrlich gesagt nicht, ähm, auch ein bisschen übertrieben. Da dachte ich auch so, naja, komm Kinder, jetzt kriege ich euch mal ein und so. Ähm, aber vielleicht äh, haben wir da auch nicht genug zugehört und die Leute in der Region hatten schon ganz gut verstanden, in welche Richtung das alles läuft und dass man sozusagen einen Weg gegangen ist, wo man diese Anwendung militärischer Massengewalt äh, nie zu irgendwelchen Konsequenzen geführt hat. Die hat in Georgien zu keinen Konsequenzen geführt. 2008 da hat Putin das nächste Mal gelernt, dass er das machen konnte. Und sie hat dann mit Verlaub bei der Besetzung der Krim äh, zu einigen persönlichen Sanktionen für sehr wenige Herrschaften geführt, was sicherlich auch nicht Herrn Putin dazu, davon überzeugt hat, dass wir es ernst meinen, ähm, sozusagen da dazwischen zu grätschen. Und äh, ganz im Gegenteil, 2015 ist dann Nord Stream 2 unterzeichnet worden. Und wenn man dieses Bild nochmal sieht von Nord Stream 2, das ist jetzt auch öfter nochmal von dieser symbolischen im, im, äh, Unterzeichnung, ähm, wie Quietsch vergnügt, äh, da die Bundeskanzlerin neben Putin steht und lacht, dann fragt man sich schon, was das in Minsk eigentlich alles für ein Theaterdonner war und äh, was wir da eigentlich sozusagen verstanden hatten oder, oder nicht verstanden haben. Das wurde ja sozusagen auch bis übrigens genau vor einem Jahr mit Werbe von verschiedenen Regierungen und Regierungsvertretern verte verteidigt, dieses Projekt. Ähm, und wenn man das kritisiert hat, dann musste man sich anhören, dass man da den Schuss nicht ganz gehört hat, was unsere deutschen Interessen sind. Und alleine der Schaden, den das, ich bin ja auch oft in Polen, den das in Polen angerichtet hat, der ist immens und zwar nicht nur für die SPD, sondern für das ganze Land. Ja, SPD braucht man gar nicht zu sagen in Polen, dann denken die sowieso gleich an Putin. Kann ich Ihnen auch sagen, ähm, nicht ähm, sozusagen, wir haben da massive Vertrauensverluste vom Baltikum bis hin nach Kiew natürlich und das wird lange dauern, das zu reparieren. Das wird nicht in wenigen Jahren repariert werden können, sondern sozusagen diese Vertrauensverluste, die wir da haben, die, ähm, die, die, die werden wir sozusagen in unsere zukünftige Ostpolitik mit einpreisen müssen, ob wir das wollen oder nicht. Ich ganz, ganz, ganz kurz. Geschichte und dass man früher hätte erkennen müssen, wer er ist und wer sein, was sein Regime ist. Aber das andere, weil es hier um Kulturdiplomatie geht, ist, sind die Kulturbeziehungen. 
auch mit einem Riesenland wie Russland. Und ich stehe voll dahinter, dass wir versucht haben in den 2000er Jahren, wo ja auch noch vieles möglich war, kulturell und wissenschaftlich mit Russland zusammenzuarbeiten. Äh, Sie kennen die Historikerkommission sowieso. Das Deutsche Historische Institut ist gegründet worden, als ich dort war, als Kulturreferentin an der Botschaft. Und später, als ich ein paar Jahre in Sibirien war, habe ich also einen Schwerpunkt auf die Förderung der deutschen Sprache, die noch sehr präsent war, auch in Schulen, in den Universitäten zu legen, aber eben auch auf diese ganze Bandbreite der Soft Power, wenn man so will, der deutschen Soft Power. Wir hatten Lehrer in russischen Schulen, wir hatten Lektoren, wir hatten Professoren, Austausch aller Art. Und ich habe das immer als eine Möglichkeit gesehen, die russische Gesellschaft vielleicht doch weiter zu öffnen und den Unterschied zu machen zwischen dem Regime auf der einen Seite und der Gesellschaft, die durchaus, sagen wir mal, doch sehr differenziert zu betrachten ist. In einem Vielvölkerstaat, das ist auch nochmal ganz wichtig Das war jetzt sehr ausführlich. Ich weiß gar nicht, ob ich wieder zurückfinde. Vielleicht zur Aufarbeitung aus kulturwissenschaftlicher Perspektive geht es ja immer um diese Konzepte von oder biologisch, genealogischen Konzepte von Bruderschaft, das hatten Sie auch ähm, angesprochen, ähm, die fatal sind, weil staatliche ähm, Konstruktionen einfach so nicht funktionieren. Wir kennen bereits die biblische Geschichte von Kain und Abel. Ja, die Brüder sind immer die ärgsten Feinde zueinander. Es gibt immer einen Jüngeren, einen Älteren und so weiter. Es funktioniert nicht. Das andere, das politische Modell, ist äh, basiert auf Feindschaft und Freundschaft. Das ist genauso tragisch und ähm, ähm, ja, wie, man muss im, im Prinzip in dieser ganzen ähm, Diskussion der Aufarbeitung dieser, ähm, ja, dieser Konstruktionen mit berücksichtigen, mit welchem politischen oder ähm, sozialen Konstrukt man hier etwas errichtet hat, was in diesem Sinne nicht funktioniert. Ja, also diese Aufarbeitung mit einzubeziehen, das ist, glaube ich, das Schwierigste, weil sowohl unsere Sprache als auch Gesetzgebung und so weiter immer auf bestimmten Konstruktionen äh, basieren, die äh, nicht aufzulösen sind aus dem ganz normalen europäischen, balkanischen und was auch immer Verständnis. And uh, you, to your question of the comparison of exotic of the Caucasus uh, region, uh, of course there are, uh, you have perhaps to differentiate uh, the self-orientalization uh, to the othering in comparison to Balkanism, which includes uh, the self. So uh, this perhaps a very short uh, answer, but of course um, um, we have in mind and also the historians have it in mind. Thank you very much for the presentations and for the discussion. Um, and we are going to move to the second part of the panel now, and we will start uh, with a presentation on Hungary uh, by Dr. Melinda Harlov Chota. And um, the question How has the 1956 revolution been communicated by Hungarian prime ministers since the regime change? It's a country, but it's a person as well. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, also, I'm sorry for the fact that we are gathering uh, due to an actuality that is very sad. And I would like to express empathy to all the people suffering due to the current events we are having. Also, I would like to um, wish quick recovery to Professor Foch. Um, I'm really honored by having this topic uh, given by him and also by the challenge to speak about it in 15 minutes. So I'm sorry if I'm going to be super quick and small and impossible to cover the, the, the whole topic. 
So let's start with um, the actual event of 1956. Uh, I'm going to show you just a quick uh, few events. I, um, there are historians uh, having um, their own whole life uh, dedicating to these 10 days of the revolution, so it's impossible for me to, to summary it up. But as you all know, this is the time when Hungarians rise up against the USSR due to international uh, events such as the Polish ones we have already heard or the fact that in 1952 uh, Austria has been um, independent but the troops stayed in our country. So uh, after the, the very short um, very short revolution there has been a four years of oppression when uh, more people were killed uh, imprisoned or left the country than uh, during the actual events uh, and one more thing which is very important due to our memory discussions that it was impossible to mention this this few events or these few days the, the events of revolution it was called as anti-revolution because revolution is what socialism is all about as we know and what happened in these 10 days was against this revolution so the the 56 events used to call anti-revolution but most probably it was not spoken about the next huge event was 1989 when the political change uh the political system change happened in hungary also due to international um changes and events and uh one of the most symbolic uh element of this political transformation is what you see hopefully there and this is the reburial of Imre Nagy, the prime minister at the time of uh, the revolution. And that happened in 1989, June 16, as you could see. Um, in all these speeches, uh, the revolution was marked as a connecting point to the events of 1989. So 1989 was a follow-up or a continuation of the revolution that happened there. Also, uh, the event was um, put in parallel to the 1848 revolution, so the whole event became a very significant historic event, similarly to many other uh, historic and political events of the country. Uh, what happens after that is a legal acts, one after the other. So a uh, legal act came already in 1989 about the rehabilitation of all those people who suffered during the, the revolution. Uh, October 23rd was named as a national holiday and the democratic system of our country was announced on the 23rd of October. So there is a clear and emphasized connection between democracy of the country and the 56th revolution as you could see, but you should not have um, forget the fact that until 1991, so two extra years more or less, we still have Russian troops. So that is the reason, partly, I assume, that uh, you could see this is um, um, a representation of the speech of Viktor Orban at 1989. And as you could see, there is no mentioning of any kind of Russia, USSR, or anything like that. The only thing that you see is communism and communists, which is more like an ideology rather than specific uh, state or people. Um, one reason you might call the fact that troops are still in our country. As a historian, you can't really look at 30 texts without really contextualizing it, and you can't contextualize 30 years in 50 minutes. So what you do see here, uh, as my humbled intention to show you the importance of the national and international events, as well as the, the prime ministers we are having. The coloring on, the, on your left-hand side is... Um, is the political party affiliation of the prime ministers. The red is the socialist party, the orange is uh, Fidesz, and uh, the green in this part is uh, the democratic forum that is rather conservative party. So uh, without going into details of um, how things happened in this covered uh, first part, I would like to emphasize that, um, sorry. that there was um, 
there were some um, key events only mentioned on the very uh, last section, so I'm not emphasizing all the events that happened internationally or nationally. Uh, there was a, a huge difference how the conservative uh, leadership and the socialist leadership start, started or tried to commemorate the events uh, because the, uh, the socialist um, affiliated parties tried to express the 1956 as a social democratic uh, intention. So what was the intention is to keeping the socialist values without the one party affiliation, whereas the, 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 the Fidesz party and Viktor Orban named it as a civil revolution which is totally different understanding of the same event. Of course, we do have other parties at that time who are more further right or further left, naming, for instance, that uh, the, the Stalinism still exists in Hungary and stuff like that. So uh, as you could see, there are already uh, problems of how we understand the events or how the end how the prime ministers interpret the events of these days. If we go further to uh, current events, you could see that um, the gray, uh, the gray ministers are supposedly independent ones, and you have only one red. And uh, Viktor Orban is on power, as you could see, over certain years now. Uh, the contemporary and the domestic policies came into picture in these speeches, so less and less emphasis on the actual historic events, more and more discussions about domestic and uh, contemporary issues. And also, uh, by the time uh, of the 2010s, there are separate commemorations, both locally by people, the audience are different, the location is different, and even though this is the supposedly the event that brings the country to democracy. This is the event that's supposed to unite the whole nation. There is no united commemoration whatsoever. So that's, uh, that's very um, problematic. I would like to emphasize the year 2006. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the commemoration and one of the key points that uh, represented how the country is separated into different powers. Um, well, the speech of the then minister, uh, Prime Minister Yu Chen was leaked and there was a huge uh, rebel on streets, almost same revolution what we have uh, had 50 years ago. I'm going to show you some images of that later on. And uh, since Viktor Orban is on power, uh, it seems that there is less and less inner enemy against whom he should be you know, talked and speak about. So he either creates new uh, enemies outside the country, or he is, uh, it seems he loses a lot of events. As you could see, at many years, we did not have any state um, commemoration, which is strange if you think that 1956 is our commemoration to, to remember. So there is pro and contra of these. How things happen? Well, uh, <clears throat> I assume you all know the politics of our government. Uh, he, he institutionalized the narrative of 1956 by establishing the House of Terror, by establishing Institute of 20th Century, and by eliminating the possibility of having any kind of scholarly works that provides multi, uh, multi voices like the 56 in, uh, institution that unfortunately uh, unable to cooperate or work anymore. So how should we analyze these texts? Every October 23rd, the prime minister goes in public and gave a speech. We need to see about that. So what, I'm, uh, what I looked at, is it commemoration or celebration? what we are gathering on the 23rd? Is it the commemoration of the loss of the revolutionist or is it the celebration of the revolution itself? Well, anyway, it's about us and not the enemy. So as you could see from the very first point, we don't care, I'm sorry to say that in this way, about the other group. Revolution is ours, we did it, no matter against whom. Secondly, uh, whether the historic event uh, are the importance or the emphasis or the realized ideology, well, uh, I would say that 
as you could see, less and less um, is the historic event, and it's more about the ideology, and the ideology is plural, unless anything else. So there are um, ideologies saying that it's civil revolution, is it uh, still existing Stalinism against which, in a dem domestically, against which we should uh, fight against, or is it the freedom fight against any foreign enemy? So you could see there are different voices, solidarity, unity, bravery, what we should uh, remember or commemorate, it is very plural. Why I'm saying also that historic event is not important, because especially at the beginning of um, the research period, veterans are still alive or were still alive. So people who actually fought this revolution were among us, but they were not invited, they were not involved in this state uh, commemorations as speaker or as any emphasis. So somehow the politicians, without those who are actually fought those revolutions, know better what to do. So that's why I said the ideology, contemporary issues are more important than what uh, really uh, the historic events won. As you could see, unfortunately, um, it's much like revolution every time we have a commemoration of 1956. So you do have um, street fights and marches and whatnot. The next question is, who is the enemy? As I said, it could not be the USSR at the beginning, or it was not without the could. Then it became the inner enemy. So those people who are still among us and were on the other side during the revolution, at least this is the claim and the narrative, and then it became the West. So what you could see as a connecting point is due to the ideology that we don't want, as you see, um, Hungary is uh, the protective pro protection for Europe, we are not going to be um, the colonized nation, it is always the foreign power against against whom we are standing up and this is only and uh, always sorry it is always someone who is rather an ideology so it it's never said this is a state it is never said something it's brussels which is super funny uh unfortunately that one city can be an enemy of a whole country if you really think about it that doesn't make any sense but this is not the only thing. Um, and then, of course, uh, many other things came. And who are the heroes? Well, it's the problematic part again. Uh, the socialist parties named Imre Nagy uh, and also Istvan Bibo, who were politicians at that time. And uh, Fidesz tried to look for those people who were not involved in the politics at that time. So young members like Twitter Mansfeld, who was a young guy, uh, uh, fought on the streets or Cardinal Josef Mincenti. So even the hero is different, not just the, the enemy at that time. And of course, uh, the mass of Pest or the mass of Seged is never named because veterans are not included in the commemoration. And about the, uh, the next question is whom the speech is addressed and what is the aim of the speech? As I said, the, uh, the audience quickly became splitted based on contemporary political um, uh, associations and understandings. And it was always, as you could see on this picture, huge uh, masses were mobilized, even uh, on both sides, I must admit. And for example, there is the civil, civil forum, uh, for United Forum of Civil Organizations that are uh, organizing every year from the 2000s this uh, March of Peace, when even people from the from the countryside are taken to the to the capital by buses in order to support to express support of the current government, and also on the other hand, um, the other uh, powers also ask people on the street. If you're looking at actual commemoration events, then you should look at uh, the location, where it is located. Is it has to anything to do with the actual political events or it is expressing rather um, something about the, 
the democracy or because it is on hero square so all those people who are fighting are heroes it is in front of house of terror so it is more about the the oppressor or is it on koshut square where the parliament is and so we are celebrating the democracy the location defines uh, also the message or at least supports it also it is very important to see the background or the setting or staging as i said or wrote here uh, uh, the socialist parties always have EU flag behind them, or but never. Uh, just to mention one uh, difference in between the two. So I would say that these these uh, small things emphasize uh, the the late message, and also what are the historic or contemporary illusions we have heard about Solidarność earlier. This is um, if you see it. We will not be um, a colonized party, so all these uh, texts are among us, but unfortunately it's even worse, so you have a text on these marching sides never again, which has nothing to do with 56 or socialism. We also have text that uh, truth makes us free, which yet again alludes to a totally different historic point. Uh, many participants uh, prefers to wear this uh, coronet that is a symbol of the March 15 national anthem and connects to 1848 on the day of commemorating 1956. So as you could see, the symbols also are collapsed, the messages are way too contemporary, and it seems that there is less and less emphasis on what actually the events was. So I am summarizing that. Um, and this is, uh, as I said, that basically uh, all the messages on both sides, or all sides, I must admit, is about contemporary and inner politics. Uh, you do see the transformation of the enemy. So from USSR, which we have never mentioned after 1989, inner political enemy, and then Brussels, you can continue the line uh, in that direction. Also, there are different narratives uh, that aims to unite uh, people or aims to uh, motivate to, to certain actions. That is unfortunately the most common ones on both sides again. And there is, as I said, confusion of symbols. And there are many uh, further studies that should and have to be done. But in 15 minutes, oops, sorry. That's what I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. And we will move straight to Dimitar and Russian influence in the Balkans before and after the Ukraine invasion. Pleasure to be with you here. I see lots of familiar faces, uh, people and colleagues we've cooperated over the years. Um, I've been given the task now to look at, at Russia um, and of course, today is the anniversary and there will be a lot of questions about what changed and what didn't uh, and how um, the new position Russia finds itself vis-a-vis -vis the West and the European Union affects the, the Balkans. But since it's a gathering of historians, um, I thought I might actually, uh, at the risk of boring you, go back in time uh, and start from the 1990s and think about Russian influence over time or Russia's involvement uh, in Southeast Europe and what are the periods and what were the stages we went through before I get to uh, 24th of February uh, 2022 um, and it, of course that was part of the book that uh, Christian kindly mentioned and Chris, uh, Christian Foss as well um, that I wrote five six years ago uh, so what I'll be doing now is just to give you a, a quick synopsis of, of my arguments. There are two things to uh, highlight from the get-go. First of all, is that um, when we talk about Russia in the Balkans, um, we shouldn't be assuming that Russia has a fixed policy, that there was a game plan that was implemented since Putin came to power or since Russia emerged from the Soviet Union, or as is the case in, in the region, very often you hear claims that since the 18th century, Russia always had this vision to conquer the Balkans, to be the hegemon, to have access to the warm sea. There's a lot of essentializing going on. Um, and I think 
um, the evidence goes counter. Um, very much you have a shift in Russian policy depending on the on the period, and what uh, Moscow has been doing in the region is very often a function of the general temperature or general atmosphere in relations with the West. There were times where you had modicum of cooperation when Russia was a difficult partner, but a partner nonetheless, all the way to now where it is a rival. So that's number one. My other claim in the book is that when we think about Russia, we shouldn't be thinking all, all, only about uh, Moscow's interests, actions, uh, and, and visions of the region, but also think about local actors. Uh, one um, conclusion from the situation we found ourselves in right now in, in Europe is that small and medium-sized countries have lots of agency. I mean, the discourse about Ukraine is poisoned with this idea that it's a clash between NATO, the US and Russia, and Ukrainians are stuck in the middle. That's what com comes from the Kremlin. You have a bit of that in the Balkans uh, as well. But the actual evidence shows how much local governments, politicians, business players, civil society has been involved in colluding with Russia, using Russia, opposing Russia as well. Uh, so it's a two-way street, uh, which I think the book uh, tried to um, probe uh, into uh, in uh, examining the material. Uh, so having in mind those two general observations, uh, what happened since 1991, uh, roughly? Um, I saw three different periods, and to get my cards on the table, I think we're still in the third period. So um, 24th of February doesn't didn't change that much uh, in the Balkans. The period number one very much coincided with the Yeltsin years and the wars in former Yugoslavia. When Russia had um, mixed motivation, and here, of course, we are talking about a different animal because Russia was much more pluralistic. There were several actors involved. On the one hand, the new state wanted to establish itself as part of a new European security uh, set up, um, which meant that at the time had to cooperate with, with the West. That was the line espoused by uh, Andrei Kozirev at the time in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who actually voted in favor of many of the US, uh, UN resolutions to sanction the Milosevic regime and, the, and run Yugoslavia. But also it involved uh, opposing the West at times. Um, working with the, Bo the Bosnian Serbs and with Milosevic without loving them and having second thoughts about their motivation. Um, and for Yeltsin at the time, um, being involved in Bosnia, especially uh, and to a less extent in Kosovo, was also a necessity driven by domestic politics because he faced stark opposition on the um, communist and the Lib Dem uh, side. You had people in those uh, factions opposing the Kremlin who used Yugoslavia domestically to push against the unpatriotic and traitorous government and to argue actually for the same revisionist policy in the former Soviet Union. In fact, the early um, years of Yeltsin, you had this idea that Soviet collapse was relatively um, more harmonious and didn't involve this sort of uh, violence and fraternal bloodshed that you had in former Yugoslavia. So it's a, it's a supreme irony that we came to this point that actually history is repeating itself because in, in the early years, there was the contrast uh, very much. This period led to some gains by Russian foreign policy. For instance, in 1994, when uh, Russian diplomats managed to negotiate the withdrawal of Serbian forces from Sarajevo, the heavy equipment, um, you had the contact groups being set up. Now, the contact group was the Russian vision of European security, where a few big players, the great powers, almost a return to the 19th century, would decide on matters where Russia would be respected, would have a stake, um, and that will be the new uh, security architecture. It later manifests itself 
after Dayton, of course, when Russia was thinking about having its own peacekeeping force under its own command. Um, of course, it ended up being integrated into NATO, the, the blue helmets Russia had on the ground, which is, again, an irony. I mean, who would believe from today's perspective that Russian troops were serving under a NATO commander? But that was the period. Um, and in Kosovo, Russia really tried its hand, of course, in a different political situation with a different leadership to balance the West and try to prevent intervention. But ultimately, it banned wagons. And many of you would remember how uh, Viktor Chernomyrdin uh, got back into the game and actually was part of uh, the UN. Uh, nego the negotiation with Mahdi Sari, ultimately the 1244 resolution. So the Yeltsin period was somewhat incoherent, but the one theme was that Russia wanted to engage and wanted to be a first rate actor because it was not just about Yugoslavia, it was about Europe. Yugoslavia was a mirror image of what would come in European affairs. It made some gains. Of course, it suffered a big setback uh, in Kosovo because it tried to take risk and ultimately failed to to capitalize on the risk. So that's period number one. Putin comes in the second stage. What does he do? Well, actually, Putin decided that the Balkans was a missed opportunity. It was not worth it. Vladimir Putin was the person who, in 2003, withdrew Russian forces from Bosnia and Kosovo. And since then, we haven't had Russian military deployment in the region. He thought, with a good reason, that Russia's game was closer to its borders to recover its primacy in the post-Soviet space and shouldn't be overstretched into Southeast Europe. So there was this engagement. It was also a more harmonious period in relations with the West when Russia rose to become the energy superpower, quote unquote. And that's how Southeast Europe came back on the agenda as a transit region. Just two dates to bear in mind, uh, 2006, when the South Stream pipeline came into being as a way to bypass uh, Ukraine, in addition to Nord Stream. And in 2008, when Russia or Gazprom Neft managed to buy the Serbian National Gas Company. Um, of course, Kosovo's independence made a difference as well that brought Russia into the region. But again, that was partly because the Serbian leadership and the President Tadic actually needed Russia as a counterbalance to improve its diplomatic position vis-a-vis -vis the West in fighting Kosovo's uh, independence. So it was mutually, um, mutually uh, driven by mutual interest. So this period, which stretches until the end of Medvedev's rule, was again a mixed bag where Russia was fighting the West, but also cooperating with the West. There was common economic interests, uh, and the Balkans was, was an area it was projecting its, uh, its role to an extent uh, under the same um, motivation that Russia was not just confined, as Barack Obama said, to its region. It's not a region, regional power, but it's a pan-European power. And as such, it has to have some um, positions elsewhere, but it was not a revisionist. Um, you couldn't see Russia replacing the West uh, as a source of economic investment, uh, provider of security uh, or alternative. In fact, it, at those days, if you look at carefully at Russian statements, I don't think they actually opposed uh, the European Union enlargement. So the EU was not the villain because they didn't think that the EU is such a threat. They didn't care about the EU. They didn't put a lot of uh, stock in, in, in the EU. They even didn't even say much about NATO enlargement in 2009 when Albania and Croatia joined, which is again interesting. I mean, it, it's not surprising because who cares? Croatia is far away from Russia's borders. The threat was minimal uh, or, or Albania, but it was a different era. Now, third period, and I apologize for rushing through <coughs> lots of events, lots of um, personalities and, and, and developments, but we can get deeper into the Q&A. I think the real game changer was when Putin returned to power and when Crimea happened, at which stage Russia reinvented itself as, as a revisionist. It saw the West 
as the enemy, uh, as um, a force seeking to undermine the regime at home and seeking to take away um, parts of what Russian elites and Putin himself considered a part of the privileged sphere of influence. And from that point on, from 2014, and possibly before, certainly since Putin came back to power and, and launched the Eurasian Economic Union, and the rest is history. From that point on, Russia's position in the Balkans, especially in the Western Balkans, but not only, has been to play the spoiler, just to make life difficult for the EU and NATO, um, to prevent enlargement, to um, sort of give uh, support to groups, political forces, politicians opposing the West, um, and to put a spanner in, in the works, rather than trying to, again, conquer the region or establish some sort of a, a leadership. Um, it has done that in many different ways, um, obviously with um, its media presence, uh, with um, its energy uh, role, uh, in the region uh, with uh, rhetoric, sometimes even taking risk, as in the case of Montenegro in 2016, when it aligned with local radical groups. Um, I mean, of course, it's more complicated because it, there's been a lot of interesting discussion and empirical work on how decision making took place. Was it the Kremlin or was it a bottom-up dynamic where some Russian nationalist groups actually um, built this influence and tried to sell their projects for regime change in Montenegro to, to the Kremlin. Um, so that's um, a complicated uh, world of Russian foreign policy. But again, the big picture here is that Russia was trying to spoil things and pre prevent NATO from enlarging and was also opposing the EU, which after Ukraine became also the enemy, not just, uh, not just NATO. What is, this, what is the um, balance sheet? Well, not very encouraging for the Russians because Montenegro joined uh, NATO. North Macedonia joined NATO despite, obviously, efforts to support nationalists in both Greece and North Macedonia opposing the PRESPA agreement. Um, so Russia hasn't been ex ex very successful in fighting those um, Western policies. But it's not a big deal for the Russians, because ultimately the underlying problems in the region that make Russia's policy possible are still there, and they're difficult to tackle, because they're indigenous. So if you think about corruption or captive states or nationalism, you don't need Moscow to export those. These are not exportable. They're generated from within. What you can do is just to take advantage and, and to uh, exploit cleavages, to put money here and there, to uh, invest in propaganda. Um, I mean, you don't need to convince Serbs that they were the victims because the victimhood narrative mm. is there already. You're preaching to the choir. And there will always be a party that is um, willing to use Russia as an external patron to make gains uh, domestically. So again, we have to be mindful of this uh, tail wagging the dog dynamic that very often journalists are covering the region uh, miss because they they look at the big guys and they um, underestimate the agency, local people who actually have stake in those political systems. Uh, exercise. So this is very broadly my take uh, of, of Russia's policy uh, in the Balkans. Um, now, let's look at what happened after 24th of February, because I think this is what you want to hear from me, right? I mean, I, uh, <laughs> well, the initial reaction was a lot of fear, uh, consternation, anxiety. And that's understandable because for many people, the invasion brought very fresh memories of the wars of the 1990s. Um, if you lived in Sarajevo and survived through the siege, 
this revanchist rhetoric coming from Moscow and the way it echoed within Serbia obviously touched on a, a raw wound. Um, but ultimately, I think um, what we saw over the past year was more of the same. So Serbia's reaction to this war is very much the Serbia's, Serbia's reaction to Crimea. You have rhetorical um, sort of attempts to say we oppose annexationism. And just yesterday, by the way, Serbia voted again uh, in the United Nations General Assembly with the West because they uh, um, sort of rhetorically are against uh, annexationism and think that inviolability of borders is sacrosanct. That's on the one level. But no alignment with the sanctions or um, sort of uh, resistance to Western pressure that Serbia should join the sanctions. But again, if you think about Serbian policy, you, should, you shouldn't start with Moscow, you should start with Vucic. And Vucic is not pro-Russian, he's not pro-Western, he's pro-Vucic. Uh, and, and I think this is well understood uh, in, in the West. Will Serbia start a war in Kosovo because Russia needs a second front uh, in the Balkans to divert attention? I don't think so. This is not what we saw in December where you had the real crisis. It was driven by local dynamics as well. Um, politicians exploited uh, uh, the situation. And ultimately, tomorrow, no, sorry, Monday, we have another summit between uh, Albin Kurti and, and Vujic when they discuss the German French plan to, to, to resolve. Um, it might not go anywhere. But my point is that Serbia will continue this balancing game between uh, East and the West until it's possible. And we can discuss how sustainable that is longer term. And equally, you have politicians elsewhere. And what I think, for example, is the elections in Montenegro, which who will be exploiting the fear of Russia. So if uh, Milo Djukanovic will be in the game uh, once again, of course, he'll style himself as the protector of the West, fighting for national sovereignty at your Russia. And, Forget about the days when he was business partner with uh, Mayor Lushkov of Moscow and all those characters. So there's that dynamic uh, as well. But um, before I conclude, let me come back to uh, the Russian side of the equation. I mean, we know the Balkan side, we know how politicians think and, and operate and how opportunistic they are. They want to have the cake and eat it and they'll have partnerships with China, with Russia, with the United Arab Emirates or whoever as long as it pays off. But what about Russian interest in the region? I think the business of becoming a leading power in the Balkans, or at least having a stake in diplomacy, is over. So Ru Russia cannot be on the same level anymore because it's become toxic. And even Serbs have to be careful how far they go with, with the Russian connection. Russian, the Balkans is a transit region for energy. Um, to a certain extent, yes, because you have the extreme. But ultimately, the region is diversifying away from Russian energy. And gas was never important. And I, I don't want to move the discussion there because it's a big issue. But Balkan economies are not dependent on Russian gas. And, and, and Russia is not such a critical player to the lo local energy markets. And there will be less and less of, of Russia um, there. What remains ultimately is spoiling, this role of a spoiler. And I'm afraid, and that's my last thing to say, is that um, going forward, if you think about this conference in 10 years' time, we'll still be discussing Russia. Because it's not difficult to spoil things. And because uh, this influence is embedded and there's a lot of local agency and local demand. And they, there will be people in the Balkans. So the vision of kicking Russia out of the Balkans uh, won't, won't happen. It's, it's, despite the Western orientation of many of those countries, there will always be residue Russian influence. Thank you very much, Dimitar. <laughs> and we will move immediately to the last presentation of today by uh, Chafta Marinov, those brothers of our brothers who oppress our brothers. In Ukraine, the Bulgarian mainstream thesis about Macedonians. 
uh, yeah, I will, um, I will focus here on the current Bulgarian Macedonian controversy surrounding uh, Macedonian history, identity and language and on the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine uh, upon them. Let me first uh, um, uh, remind you that since 19, uh, since, uh, sorry, since uh, 2019, being a member state, uh, hence in a strong position, um, Bulgaria has formulated a, ser a series of preconditions uh, regarding North Macedonia's EU accession that have blocked uh, the negotiations between Skopje and the EU, at least uh, until the so-called uh, French proposal from uh, uh, last summer. Uh, most of the Bulgarian requirements uh, concern uh, the right interpretation of what is seen in Sofia as a common history of Bulgaria and Macedonia, as well as the existence of a separate uh, Macedonian language distinct from Bulgarian, focused on national identity of Macedonians. These preconditions were progressively upgraded with demands regarding the official recognition and rights of a Bulgarian national minority uh, in uh, North Macedonia. In an unpredictable way, uh, Bulgaria's veto on Macedonian EU accession coincided last year with the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine that had different and curious uh, impacts uh, on um, this uh, Balkan controversy. Uh, so my intention here is twofold. First, to present certain conspicuous uh, similarities uh, or indeed common points between Russian nationalist claims concerning Ukrainian national identity and nation state, the way they have been formulated particularly by President Putin on the one hand, and the Bulgarian claims regarding Macedonian national identity on the other, the way uh, these are stated either in uh, official documents or in the Bulgarian mainstream historiography on which uh, these uh, state documents uh, are based. Uh, second, I will try to uh, present briefly the ways the Russian war uh, in Ukraine uh, tends to uh, reformulate uh, certain uh, sets of uh, arguments. Uh, let me nevertheless uh, make three uh, disclaimers by tracing certain analogies between the Bulgarian official discourse on Macedonian identity and Putin's discourse regarding uh, Ukraine. I do not suggest that Bulgaria is likely to invade North Macedonia the way Russia did in Ukraine. Nevertheless, I would quote uh, Professor Brunbauer here, uh, who recently uh, formula uh, wrote the following. Uh, at a historical moment when denial of the distinctiveness of the identity and history of a nation serves as a ju justification for a brutal war of aggression and cultural annihilation, the EU uh, needs an early warning system against policymakers who pursue uh, irredentism and question the existence of other nations, however unlikely their designs are to ever turn into reality. My second warning, as my paper, uh, paper's focus is uh, on discourses and claims, uh, it is far from presenting a clear picture of the political landscape in Bulgaria uh, or in North Macedonia and of the importance of the Russian soft power uh, in it, uh, uh, the real depend or the real dependence of certain political and economic circles on uh, Russian support, uh, the way uh, Russian hybrid propaganda uh, and its prox proxies work, and so on. And uh, I do not claim that political messages in Bulgaria that remind in one way or another the Russian claims regarding Ukrainian identity are necessarily related to uh, a real dependence on Russian financial, political or other support. It is enough to say that nationalist cliches about Macedonian history, language and identity in Bulgaria are quite popular across the political spectrum so that they are uh, not limited to extreme right uh, nationalist parties that are quite probably uh, with uh, pro-Russian leanings. Sometimes uh, liberally minded public uh, commenters in Bulgaria who are also critically minded regarding uh, Russian invasion can also share nationalist cliche, uh, claims concerning Macedonia. S and sometimes, quite often actually, they would prefer to remain silent concerning the Bulgarian veto on Macedonian EU accession as they believe that there is something deeply wrong about Skopje's policy or about the existence of a Macedonian identity in general. This fact shows to what extent regarding Bulgarian-Macedonian relations, no viable non-nationalist alternative is on offer in the Bulgarian political field. 
let me let me also state uh, that the sources I use are not systematically selected, and especially in so far as the Russian policy is concerned, uh, is concerned, uh, they are far from being uh, exhaustive. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they are certainly representative and make uh, possible a certain comparison, comparison between the Russian uh, claims regarding Ukrainians and Bulgarian Macedonian identity conflict. The risk here, of course, is um, uh, would be uh, perhaps uh, to exaggerate the importance of uh, this of, of ethnic claims in the Russian case, which I uh, personally tend to analyze. Um, Exclusively, exclusively through the prism of the Bulgarian Macedonian uh, context. In any case, on the Russian side, I would mostly use Vladimir Putin's article from July uh, 2021 on the historical unity of uh, Russians and Ukrainians. Among the relevant documents in the case of Bulgaria are the so called framework position on EU enlargement adopted by Boyko Borisov's government in October. Uh, 2019, the subsequent declaration on the same question voted by the Bulgarian parliament, as well as the so-called explanatory memorandum sent in September 2020 to the relevant office of the Council of the European Union and to other EU member states. Although the text of the memorandum was not officially commented by Bulgarian authorities, it was leaked to, uh, to media. These and similar official documents are based on an um, extremely biased academic and pseudo-academic production in Bulgaria uh, that has been particularly encouraged lately. Uh, it is a question of publications like this white book uh, to the left, uh, white book on the Bulgarian Macedonian language dispute published in uh, 2021, immediately translated into English, German and other languages and widely spread by Bulgarian diplomatic agents abroad. To a large extent, these and similar publications are nothing new. For the most part, they tend to recycle ideological points uh, already existing, existing in polemical publications from the socialist period when this Bulgarian Macedonian identity controversy started and developed. For instance, this booklet uh, to the right on the unity of the Bulgarian language in the past and nowadays published in uh, 1978. It is easy to see uh, that in all these cases, the emphasis uh, is laid on a presumed um, ethno-national unity, the one of Ukrainians and Russians, or of Bulgarians and Macedonians, that has been allegedly, allegedly uh, disrupted by some, uh, but somehow continues to be the natural, uh, normal state of affairs. By the way, the analogies between uh, the Russian-Ukrainian and the Bulgarian-Macedonian case are easy to trace as they have been uh, already made by exponents of the Russian policy in Bulgaria, like this former diplomat, secret service agent, journalist and politician. So in what way are the Ukrainians, Russians, Macedonians? Uh, here are some common points um, we can distill uh, from um, Putin's article on the historical unity um, of Russians and Ukrainians and from the Bulgarian mainstream narrative. First of all, uh, the idea that the other nation, uh, or the Ukrainian one in the case of uh, Russia or the Macedonian nation in the case of um, Bulgaria, is an artificial na uh, a nation with an artificial language uh, that is uh, not uh, rooted in, his, in uh, the historical reality. Uh, also, it is uh, the identity of the other country is um, uh, qu most uh, um, often uh, presented as created by foreign powers. Uh, so Poland and Austria in the case of Ukraine, Serbia or Yugoslavia, and the com but also the com Comintern, the Soviet Union in the case of Macedonia here. The things are, of course, a little bit more co complex. So um, uh, depending on the, also the po political um, orientation of um, um, the commenter, um, the emphasis is laid either on Serbia, um, Yugoslavia, or on uh, the importance of the uh, commun communist past, of the Comintern of the Soviet Union. Uh, so the other the third uh, point, the other country is governed by, by, still governed by foreign powers. The West in Ukraine, or uh, Serbia, Belgrade uh, in North Macedonia, according to the most common uh, Bulgarian cliche. Uh, the other nation is also presented as a totalitarian project. Uh, its architects were communists, uh, so as uh, Putin um, emphasizes Bolsheviks in the case of Ukraine, but to a certain extent also uh, the Soviet Union uh, even after that. Uh, or uh, Yugoslav, Soviet and Bulgarian communists in the case of uh, Macedonia 
well here the uh, the difference is that uh, uh, this also reference to uh, Nazis uh, in the case of uh, Ukraine in the Russian um, uh, uh, discourse. Uh, our country, uh, yeah, this is the next point. Our country, meaning either Russia or Bulgaria, gener generously recognized their independence. Here comes the quite common cliche in Bulgaria. Bulgaria first was the first country to recognize Macedonia, which is a historical fact, only that it, of course, there was a certain strategy behind all that. Uh, and uh, uh, here comes also the lamentation that we have only helped them helped them since the 1990s, especially in the 1990s, which were so, so difficult uh, in both cases. Uh, but and how, now we see uh, the, the lack of gratitude uh, for that. Uh, and especially, uh, yeah, this lack of gratitude is um, um, reflected in the fact that their national uh, ideology is, well, presumably, presumably directed against us. So here comes uh, the, well, Putin's uh, um, uh, depiction of Ukraine as anti-Russia, of a uh, project of Ukraine as a project of anti-Russia, or the so-called Macedonianism or Macedonian nationalism, which is constantly, um, constantly uh, presented as a, an ideology created on an anti-Bulgarian grounds uh, in Bulgaria. Here comes also the quite common uh, reference to hate speech and complaint of uh, hate speech on behalf of the, uh, of the other country. Uh, nevertheless, uh, despite all this, uh, all this, we still share a common history. Well, in both cases, there is a, this. Yeah, there comes this talk of a historical unity between our nations, and uh, suddenly a certain contradiction. They are our brothers, naturally, but they somehow deny also human rights of our brothers to, to our minority. Um, uh, here, uh, let me say that in the case of Bulgaria, the talk of a Bulgarian minority in Macedonia is a relatively recent, or at least on political level. Uh, maybe because uh, traditionally, well, the idea was to emphasize that the Bulgarian identity of the majority. Uh, so uh, this is a relatively, a relatively recent development in the Bulgarian uh, policy. Um, and uh, in the most ec extreme cases, there is the, this complaint of genocide uh, directed against our people in the respective country. So what was uh, the effect of the war in uh, Ukraine upon uh, this Bulgarian Macedonian controversy in particular, uh, in so far as the public debates are concerned? Um, well, uh, nationalist opposition in uh, both um, North Macedonia and Bulgaria is often visibly uh, pro-Russian, especially in the Bulgarian case. But the bilateral uh, controversy um, involved mostly around the real or alleged uh, Russophilia of the ruling circles uh, and of the mainstream politics in the two countries. Otherwise, at least in Bulgaria and uh, uh, at the meetings of this extreme right, Vazraj and the Revival Party, Russian flags are quite a common, uh, common thing. Um, and in some cases, although this is very rare, we can see also displaying a Russian, uh, displaying a Russian um, uh, flags also uh, at meetings of the Vemero de Pemene party in, in Macedonia. Uh, so uh, some Macedonian commenters um, actually emphasized the, these similarities between Bulgarian and Russian uh, nationalist claims as uh, they um, uh, stated Bulgaria uses Russian type of arguments and recycles ideological points dating back to Zhivkov's uh, communism. Uh, well, this was obviously this is uh, somehow un uncomfortable for the Bulgarian uh, polemicists. So uh, the Bulgarian po uh, policymakers um, replied with uh, defamation of Macedonian identity, especially in international circles. So Macedonian identity is uh, once again presented as Cominterns, has hence a Russian invention. Uh, so uh, must, no, it is, uh, there is this uh, warning um, on behalf of uh, uh, Bulgarian representatives that uh, North Macedonia would be Russian's Trojan horse in the EU, as Macedonian political elite is allegedly communist and pro-Serbian, hence pro-Russian. There is this, all this chain of equivalence uh, communism, Russia, uh, and also Serbia in the in the Bulgarian um, in the Bulgarian nationalist uh, thinking. Uh, 
Uh, of course, here we must say that uh, there are Bulgarian nationalist politicians who are supposedly pro-Russian and use similar, they use similar claims regarding the totalitarian character of Macedonian national ideology, but of course they refrain from referring openly uh, to Russia. Um, this might, might be the case also of the president of the Republic, uh, Radev. Uh, Bulgarian anti-communist uh, self-victimization is another is well actually the last uh, uh, topic that I would um, uh, discuss um, uh, because it is uh, uh, in a particular way related uh, to uh, the current uh, controversies. Uh, in a way, yeah, something that I should have mentioned already is this entang particular entanglement of uh, um, uh, Russo, uh, let's say, well, anti. Um, anti-Putinist uh, discourse, uh, Russophobia, and also anti-communism uh, in the Bulgarian case. There is a, uh, yeah, another chain of equ equivalence. Russia means Soviet past, meaning communism. So uh, here, uh, this anti uh, here, the anti-communist discourse plays a certain role. Uh, this, uh, uh, particular with this self-victimization, which is in the, uh, the its first aspect is uh, for internal use, so to say. Um, uh, many uh, commenters um, um, uh, in the public space of Bulgaria um, claim that in 1944-45 Russia uh, basically did the same to Bulgaria as uh, the, the, what actually does it now with, with Ukraine, which is clearly quite problematic historically and tends to idealize in a very non-critical way the pre-communist past. How this is addressed to Macedonia, this particular kind of victimization, um, a very thorny uh, issue in the Bulgarian-Macedonian uh, relations is the uh, question of the Second World War and the occupation of, of Macedonia by Bulgaria during the Second World War. So uh, uh, for uh, traditionally in the Macedonian historical narrative, there is the cliches about the Bulgarian fascist occupiers uh, during the Second World War. And suddenly Bulgarian commanders um, uh, uh, yeah, um, emphasize that actually this matches quite well uh, Putin's denigration of Ukrainians as, as Nazis. So uh, there is this uh, instrumentalization in this case of the Russian invasion, but for the purposes of a, a very non-critical actually treatment of the past. Um, and um, yeah, this is yeah really the last point. Uh, it is uh, once again, um, from the Bulgarian liberal critics of the veto, they quite often uh, emphasize that it really serves uh, Russian policy in the Balkans. Nevertheless, there is also the trend to uh, accuse Macedonian government as well for the lack of progress. So thus, we can come back to the thesis of the Macedonian authorities as a kind of communist elite. And I will really stop here. Sorry for yeah, taking too much time. Thank you very much, and um, I would like to invite you all uh, straight to the panel. And um, I would again like to encourage the audience to raise their hands for questions. And we would definitely start with questions for Melinda on Hungary, because she has to leave quarter past five. And I would suggest we give it another 15 minutes we have for discussion. And Manuel, is your question for Melinda? Which, who has a question for Melinda? Um, OK, so we start with these two questions. Yes, uh, English or German? Yeah, English, yeah. Uh, I'm Gregor Meyer. I'm the correspondent for the German press agency in Belgrade and in Budapest. And uh, uh, thank you for this presentation, but I would like uh, to ask what is your assessment that we have the absurd situation that uh, uh, Viktor Orban is doing a quite Moscow-friendly politics. He is somehow a quite uh, um, disturbing uh, European reactions uh, to to Russia, and what I see in Hungary, there is also a quite a, a good sympathy for Russia and a, a a big deal of antipathy against Ukraine, which is a victim of aggression, and with this fifty six history in the background, how how is it how, how could this happen? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Marika Jolly. Um, 
I was just wondering uh, two two important first thank you for for a very interesting presentation and uh, two important things happened in the period you covered so post uh, 1989 one is that um Hungary became part, I mean, EU member state. The second thing is that uh, Hungary allowed um, a large number of Hungarians living outside Hungary to become um, citizens or, or dual citizenship, Slovakia and, and Vojvodina. Um, so I was wondering whether, you know, whether the change in the narrative and moving away from uh, commemorating 1956 is related to actually how Hungary, I mean, was positioning itself as a country more in, in Europe and, and globally, and was it maybe due to change of audiences that uh, the Hungarian uh, prime ministers were talking to? Thank you. Um. Other questions for Melinda? I saw Jens Bastian's hand. Not for her. Okay. Any other question on uh, the Hungary issue? Otherwise, we proceed with the answers and then Melinda unfortunately has to go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, these are super complex questions. So please do not expect to me like a complex and detailed answer, not just because of my taxi and airport uh, issue. Uh, about um, the different reactions to uh, current events, I would say it's, um, it's a very, <clears throat> very well established tactique uh, on both sides. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe this is a natural um, process, but our society is, uh, is separated and um, and in different sections in many 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 ways. So uh, it is not just the first uh, election of uh, Viktor Orban when friends and families were uh, separated because of political decisions. And the same uh, very harsh and different standpoints you could see regarding the current events. So as much as you see pro one side. I can assure you there is the same amount of people or at least the same intensity to stand in sympathy of the other side. Plus, um, uh, I guess as all politicians, but uh, our prime minister especially plays an as excellent role in saying one thing to the international media and in Brussels and saying totally different thing within the country. Also, and also, uh, it depends on which media uh, you watch. So you have the same historic event explained to you in a very oversimplified, medialized way in both sides. So it is very difficult to say that Hungarians as whole saying in this or that side. And unfortunately, the understanding of 56 is not any different. So both, it depends on the teacher in high school, how you, how you learn the history. It depends on your personal family background, how you understand the previous political system, even today when we have almost as many years went by since 1989 than before, if I, this is one thing. Uh, I hope I more or less point to your answer. Uh, regarding uh, big events covered, yes, there were quite a few, but the two you named were definitely important. And the two were, again, going back to the first question, separated both the nation and the political understanding of the two things. And um, <clears throat> positioning of the audience um, by our prime minister, I would say that uh, there were a period when he tried, or not he, but the politics, I should say in passive voice, the politics was in a way um, pluralistic, meaning there were many parties. And then somehow it became only one party, one actually working party. And how that happens is that uh, uh, Fidesz has been um, 
I try to look for the politically correct words, incorporating other other parties. And in and every time he incorporate another party, he transform his audience and message as well. So there were even more far right uh, narratives of the same party when it was the far right party that has to be uh, addressed and involved and improved in a way. I hope you, want, you get my point. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, thank you also for the presentation. I'm really and sorry I have to leave, but I have to teach tomorrow from 9 a.m. and I have to be home for that. Thank you very thank much you. For, your, for your kindness. Great that you still took the time and nevertheless joined us. Um, we continue with Manuel Sarrazin and his question. Please. So I wanted to um, put uh, one question or remark with two arguments. And I think uh, in all the great presentations, one aspect came a little bit short, which I would like to be more highlighted in this question on Russia and Western Balkans, or let's say Serbia especially. I think that the, let's say, ideology of Kosovo uh, is much more like one of the highlights and itself topics since 1999 than we might estimate. I remember always when we were meeting as Greens with Memorial since uh, the Kosovo war, we never agreed with Memorial, unlike on Ukraine, on the question of if the NATO did right or wrong in 1999. Um, so I think that this question of Kosovo was somehow, although I think in general it's clear that there was not the impetus for Russia to have uh, like a real competition of power regarding Kosovo to the NATO, but anyhow, it was seen as a kind of, or was portrayed, or had the potential of the one big betrayal argument, which could also be exploited as an argument afterwards. And I think also today, to a certain extent, in an interesting way, also the view from Serbia towards Russia was quite looked a lot through the spectacle. And I personally have the feeling that when Vucic perhaps believed until, he would say, November 2021, 20, uh, that he knows what Putin thinks, he knows what he will do, and he is one of the persons in world who understands Putin the best. The change of Russian outlook on this question of uh, um, um, uh, annexation, um, to a certain extent showed also to Serbia or to Vucic that he cannot trust on his assumption on what Putin will be doing anymore. So it's also a potential for a break, not a far break. We'll stay in the guidelines of you, but I think that this, this Kosovo argument is, I want it just to be more highlighted. Um, second point is on this Bulgaria question. My feeling is that when we look to the Western Balkans and the place where Russia is a spoiler is having the biggest, the currently biggest strategic interest, it is Bulgaria. Because Bulgaria is the only country of the region that is providing in a relevant mean military, uh, essential military aid um, to Ukraine. And you have this insight, you called it indigenous, I think, or Zoran uh, uh, called it indigenous uh, native uh, splits to exploit on. So I think that actually when we talk about North Macedonia, it is a tool for Russia to influence Bulgaria to swap over and not so much to have influence in North Macedonia to not join on EU track or something like that. So um, I think we sometimes underestimate the strategic importance about Bulgaria um, for Russia because we see them as a problem to a certain extent, but uh, they might be rhetorically uh, a problem, um, but regarding concrete actions towards Ukraine, they had quite a decisive manner. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a, a big list now. We have uh, Jens Bastian, then Gudrun Steinacker, and then Tobias Lessenkemper. It's a question addressed to Dimitar. You spoke a lot about the influence and the impact that Russia has or is seeking to have in the region. And you mentioned repeatedly the word spoiler. My question is, does that equate to strategic depth? of Russia in the region. Because my impression is from what you said, it's very much an elite driven, Putin with or Yeltsin with, whoever is in power in individual countries. But it lacks strategic priorities. It lacks strategic outlook 
that is more than just spoiling the party. Um, thank you. And Gudrun Steinacker? Uh, two questions to Mr. Bechev. You did not mention Republika Srpska in detail. And I think, uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, n it's a strong symbol if uh, the, in my view, not really re-elected uh, president of Republika Srpska, Mr. Dodik, is uh, um, yeah, practically uh, uh, decorating uh, Mr. Putin uh, on a very special day. And it, it's a provocation. And I think it is also driven by his own interests. Also, he is making mostly uh, politics for himself, like Mr. Vucic, like Mr. Orban. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I think this is also exploited uh, by Russian partners. And one, one aspect also, the so-called night wolves, have been traveling around the Balkans in the past years, for a couple of years already. And uh, this also may not really mean a, a Russian uh, strategy to, to um, uh, militarize or uh, gain, yeah, so certainly they wanted to uh, support their supporters in the region, but I would like to hear something about what this, uh, a special relationship of Republika Srpska and some other extremist uh, parties, uh, groups uh, in, in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Tobias. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, basically, more or less to both in a way. Um, and picking up on where Jens left it, I, I, of course, homemade problems are there. It's easy to piggyback on them. But I have been observing over the last 20 years actually that this, of course, provides a platform for Russian opportunism, but there is a bigger game in, in town. And that's the erosion of European unity. And European unity is obviously in short supply when it comes to the Balkans. We need to think about the 22-5 split regarding Kosovo, the issues with regard to Northern Macedonia, etc. So how can we create more awareness about the exact opportunism of Russia um, going into these fields where there isn't enough European unity to actually move things forward? And the examples are exactly that that, of course, then erodes ex treaties. It starts with the attack on the ICTY, where we have the 30th anniversary. It's various peace arrangements that are being attacked, and or at least those who attack them are being supported to Russia. It's a stabilization and association agreement, including, of course, the alignment issues, but also, of course, in the energy field, uh, the European energy community, where Russia has been quite systematic since 2006 to make sure that the energy community would never take up any kind of speed. So the question is, how can we create more awareness, say, in Brussels, to use that short term, uh, about that there's too much of a door opening for exactly Russian opportunism to erode exactly the achievements of European unity, which are necessary to move forward with reforms in the region. Thank you very much. So we have a, a couple of uh, statements and questions, and you will have a final <laughs> round to answer them. So we have. Uh, the, the point uh, on the question of Kosovo as the big betrayal, uh, the point that Vucic probably doesn't trust Putin anymore after uh, the attack because uh, he, he cannot calculate his politics and the strategic importance of Bulgaria and its support uh, to Ukraine, then uh, the lack of Russia's strategic thinking in the region, uh, as it was claimed, uh, the relationship of the RS, the Republika Srpska, and uh, extremist groups from Russia and uh, the erosion of European unity and how uh, we can create, create awareness uh, how Russia uses uh, these, these uh, loopholes that the EU leaves for it. Yeah, plenty of uh, material to chew upon and thanks for the great uh, observations. I apologize that 15 minutes is hard to cover so much ground. Uh, on Kosovo 1999 and its uh, impact on Russia longer term, I think for the Russians, and here I mean especially elites, but also the public to a great extent, the trauma of Kosovo is that Russia realized it's not a great power, that the US can do whatever it pleases, and Russia has no way of stopping the US despite what they came to believe. And that was reinforced also by Iraq, 
uh, in 2003 when the same thing happened. So it's really a, the status injury. But having said that, think about what happened after Kosovo 1999. Putin comes into power, 9-11. All of a sudden, the Russian-NATO dialogue is restored. Um, the West becomes a partner. So there's been a lot of flexibility. It's not that after Kosovo, Russia decided to cut ties with strategic ties with the West. Um, Russia was providing access to Afghanistan for NATO material and troops over years and years. So uh, in retrospect, we can rewrite history. But if you were in the Kremlin, in the early 2000s. I don't think Kosovo, Kosovo really matters, but it didn't uh, tie Russia's hands. On Vucic and Kosovo, it's really interesting. First of all, I see that Vucic has been trying the, the Djukanovic argument from time to time, <laughs> telling Western leaders that he's under threat by the Russians. He's been doing playing this game. Um, you saw it recently when he said Wagner is doing harm in Serbia. So don't press me on Kosovo because I'm threatened by those radical nationalists. You have to be generous to me. You have this dynamic. He did it even before uh, around the lockdowns when there was a demonstration against COVID measures. And then the pro-government tabloids all of a sudden started circulating a story about Russian plots. I mean, he didn't, they didn't name Putin. They, they said that was, that was the Russian security services. But you could see this cynical game of one day Russians are brothers, the next day they're the threat. And behind closed doors, I'm, I'm sure he's uh, using that uh, a lot. Uh, Bulgaria, I mean, the one Russian argument I think that really works in Bulgaria, it's not about nationalist sentiments. Uh, it's the fear that if governments get involved in Ukraine, we'll be dragged into a war which is the same argument that won the elections in Hungary for Orban. And it has resonance also in Slovakia and elsewhere. Uh, the, the, the sort of the idea that we are small, we are small state, uh, we are pressured from all sides, and we have to stay neutral. Um, this is the one motivation that really gets people going. Because sociological polls have shown with the Bulgarian public that um, the the greatest chunk of the electorate is pro-Western in the sense that they support your membership, they recognize the benefits, but traditionally it's also friendly towards Russia. So they would, if you can say, speculate about typical Bulgarian with all the caveats, um, the person will be, let's be friends with everyone. Now the war changed that somewhat, but I think this is the disposition. And the moment you have somebody using scaremongering tactics, let's keep our heads low because, I mean, the risks are enormous. It's not our game. It's the Americans versus the Russians, and let's stay out of this. This has a great poor effect. And, but, but you're right. I mean, Russia consistently has shown its hand in Bulgaria because let's remind everyone that you have a couple of... Um, a couple of uh, occasions where Russians blew up... Uh, uh, ammunition depots in Bulgaria. It's pretty much well uh, documented of sabotage actions. Um, and I mean, you have a uh, much denser connection than, than Serbia because again, Serbia during the Cold War was not a Soviet satellite. I mean, my, uh, maybe some of you would have heard it from me and I apologize for repeating myself, but basically during the communist period, we were watching Soviet war films and the Yugoslavs were watching their own partisan movies with Western stars. Uh, so so they, they, there was a disconnect in Serbia, uh, definitely, because of this Cold War period, which is really important. And it's not the case in Bulgaria. We have also uh, mixed marriages. I mean, the leader, the former leader of the Socialist Party, uh, Sergei Stanishev, who was leader of Socialists as well, he was born in Kherson, of a Ukrainian mother, he had a Russian passport. I mean, the connection is much more uh, immediate. So you, you're right in, in a sense. Um, strategic depth, um, I think this connects. I mean, Russia is not really embedded in, in Western Balkan society, but I think elite, elites collude because they have common interests, strategic or, uh, or economic. 
and at the society level, especially among Serbs, but also Macedonians to, to a degree, this idea of being victimized by the West and being in the periphery and, and being wronged um, opens the gateway. But yeah, I mean, Russia doesn't have a positive agenda in the sense that China does have, because what is the Chinese message that Jens has studied? That we provide developmental aid, that we invest and we'll build your industry. And that's not much you see by that, that way in Russia. Um, Republika Srpska, I mean, it's very interesting because, um, of course, uh, Doric used Putin. Uh, he went to Moscow before the elections. It was almost an endorsement, which is rational from his part, because if you're fighting for the Serbian vote and Putin is very popular, of course you want to see that Moscow is on your side and not on the side of the opposition in Republic of Srpska. Um, but I think that Doric is also trying to diversify its alliances, his alliances. Uh, in addition to Putin, there is also Viktor Orban. Why is, Doric, why is Doric not under EU sanctions? He is under US sanctions, he's under UK sanctions, but the EU has failed to sanction him. And it's partly to do with Hungary protecting him. So tomorrow it will be also somebody else. And Doric started as a pro-Western politician. So there's a bit of cynicism there as well. Russia is important in Bosnia, not just because of the radicals, but because institutionally it's there. It's part of the Dayton settlement. It's in the Peace Implementation Council. It has a vote on the UN Security Council and it's by default part of the international setup. Uh, it, didn't, it, it didn't prevent, uh, it didn't veto the EU peacekeeping operation, which many people uh, expected. Um, and we can discuss privately why that was the case, but it, this is important. And finally, one thing is, uh, not just the Night Wolves, but also Wagner. That was an interesting story. Wagner has set up a um, recruitment center in Serbia. Uh, you could see how Vucic, uh, but possibly Republika Srpska leadership might see that as a problem as well. Because those guys, those nationalist leaders in the Western Balkans, uh, bred a monster using nationalism for electoral and mobilization and legitimacy purposes. But maybe the genie is out of the bottle with some of those far right radicals now not, are not under control. And the moment you want to compromise with the West, um, say on Kosovo, you have, uh, you have a problem because some of those people will be calling you a traitor. Um, but you know, on balance, and that's the last thing I'm going to say, I mean, Vucic, actually benefits from the presence of those hardcore pro-Russians as opposed to the cynical pro-Russians. Because again, if you have Wagner, if you have people demonstrating the Kosovo deals, he can use that in Berlin, in Paris, and in Brussels as a way to say, you know, you might dislike me, I might be an authoritarian ruler, but I mean business and, and you have people to the right who are much nastier and, uh, much more prepared to do what Putin wants them to do. Dimitra, so Chapter, you have the final five minutes of, of yeah. answers. Please grab the microphone. Um, since I'm not a political scientist, um, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not a specialist of uh, international relations either, uh, I, uh, I deal with uh, narratives, so th that's why I focused on narratives. And of course, there are interesting things to say about narratives as well on this um, concerning Russian, um, uh, yeah, the uh, Russian, um, uh, let's say, role um, in the Bulgarian Macedonian uh, controversy. Uh, uh, like, uh, for instance, suddenly when uh, certain, yeah, certain declarations, certain statements that are um, always. Um, um, perceived in Bulgaria as a kind of provo provocation on behalf of Russia. Like, for instance, suddenly when a, uh, the Russian embassy or another uh, um, uh, institution um, declares that uh, Syrian Bedodias come from uh, Macedonian lands, and uh, it is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, for, uh, unfortunately, uh, Bulgaria is an easy target from this point of view. But yeah, uh, I agree that uh, certainly. Mm, must be, yeah, uh, it must be important to the Russian policy in a way. 
Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank all panelists of today, uh, all of them who, who are left by now, uh, for, uh, for the panel, for interesting uh, discussions and for fascinating presentations. And we can continue now uh, the debate in the break. So a final applause to our panelists. <laughs>